Hotline, Willie D. Mace, 1025-1063, The Game and The Game Nashville app. We are streaming live on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook Live every single day. My goodness, is there a lot going on. The Titans signed Calvin Ridley, and I said thank you, thank you, thank you, Santa Ran Carthon. Ranta Claus, if you will. Thank you for bringing this team a certified number one receiver. The Titans also signed Mason Rudolph. The Predators with a massive win on the road in Winnipeg yesterday. It is SEC tournament time at Bridgestone Arena. Round one tips off in just over an hour. Mississippi State and LSU will keep you updated with all of the SEC tournament action throughout the show. And today's edition of Caroline Willie and D Mace is at Bet MGM Sports Lounge at Bridgestone Arena. It's where the Patron Club used to be, if you uh, if you are familiar with the Patron Club. It is nice. It's a beautiful day. They've got the windows open. Uh, Broadway is popping. I see a bunch of Kentucky shirts and Tennessee shirts and Mississippi State shirts. It's a good day. D. Mace is here. Willie Donick joins us from Seattle. How are we doing? Doing well, man. Um, Caroline, Willie, I don't, I'm sure, Willie, you've been here before at MGM. But this is my first time. Um, this is a wonderful place. It's Beautiful. unrecognizable considering what the last, you know, what they use this uh, space for the last time. It seemed like they just revamped the whole thing. They've opened up the windows. More sunlight comes in and a bunch of televisions. Is, I mean, set two floors, basically. Uh -huh. You know, I, it, it's nice. I love it up here. They have great food, too. Oh, man. I got my teeth so. out. You know. You're ta you're yeah, taking yeah. care of <laughs> on the tea diet. <laughs> Willie D, how are we doing today? I'm doing great. It's uh, bright and early here in sunny Seattle, and better than Winnipeg. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> it's improved. It's improved. No question about it. I I'll uh, take what we got in Winnipeg, you know, weather-wise. That's for sure. But uh, yeah, I miss hanging out with you guys. It is truly becoming March Madness here. You add all this free agency, the NFL, to the already. You know, busy schedule with all the college basketball games going on, all the big hockey games down the stretch. It's really an exciting time. I mean, there, there's so much going on. It's awesome. Well, Willie, hopefully y'all were able to bring some of that heat the Predators were putting on the ice. Hope you were able to bring some of that heat to Seattle. Well, let's hope. I mean, that, that was one heck of a performance last night. Man, man they just took it. Too, one of the best teams in the NHL last night. Uh, I don't think anybody would argue that Winnipeg is one of the five or six top dogs in terms of contenders for the Stanley Cup. And it was no contest last night. Nat Nashville just beat them for three periods, took a 4 nothing lead early in the third period and sort of coasted from there. If you just saw the final score, it wasn't even that close. Yeah, Willie, you said it. The Predators t uh, take down the Winnipeg Jets yesterday in their home barn 4-2. And it was really just kind of garbage time final goal. Like it was four nothing Predators, and they came out on an absolute heater. And like you said, Willie, they are a certified Cup contending team. And going into yesterday's game, I thought that there was really two ways that you could have looked at that matchup, and maybe both things were were really true at the same time. First and foremost, you could look at it and say, look, Winnipeg is a really good team. The Predators throughout that point streak and the win streak have given themselves enough cushion in the playoff standings that they could afford to drop a game and still feel comfortable understanding how good of a team Winnipeg truly is. But also on the other side of the coin, you could have looked at the game and said, this right here is a litmus test that the Predators, what Barry Trotz did at the trade deadline, very much so proved to me and probably proved to you that the Predators are making a push for the playoffs. They don't want to just get into the playoffs. They want to be competitive in the playoffs. So they're now taking on a cup contending team in their own home arena. Now, this is a measuring stick kind of game to see, OK, not, now that you find yourself in a comfortable position in the standings, how competitive can you be against a cup contending team that you may? There is a high possibility that the Predators could face the Winnipeg Jets in the, in the first round of the playoffs. So I don't know how you could step away from last, last night's game how the Predators were just on it. The energy was there. They were clicking on all cylinders from the very beginning of the game and not feel super encouraged about what the Predators, how competitive the Predators could be in that first round of the playoffs. And I know we have a lot of hockey left. I know you have to get in the dance before you advance in the dance. But what a good measuring stick for those Nashville Predators. They looked fantastic last night. You see Soros was playing well. They got contribution up and down the lineup. We've said that is the formula for this team to win games. 
Yes, and you know we've been saying all all year long the the Bruno effect is is really something to watch. Andrew Burnett is going to join us at eleven thirty. When you look at underlying numbers, their system gives them a chance each night. But now they continue to convert more of the chances, and now they're getting the really good goaltending that they should have had all year long that for whatever reason they didn't for a little over half of the season. But you put it all together now, and I think your question is starting to become a legit question, and that is if they get in, are they going to be quite as big an underdog as they would seem? Uh, and I'm not sure after a game like that. I, but I don't think you're going to get Andrew Burnett to say much about that until yeah. they actually get an X by their name and clinch a playoff spot because a lot can happen for sure. But when, you, when they put their best out there, uh, I just wonder how much of the gap they've closed on some of these heavyweights who have we've been talking about. They all loaded up. Winnipeg was one of them. They added new guys. And there's still, I think, an adjustment period for some of the teams that did add some players and the Predators would be in that mix right Jason Zucker and Anthony Bovillier are still getting used to how you play in, in the Bruno effect right in the brunette system mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's going to be something that happens over the next few weeks but by the time the playoffs start I, I think that is going to be something to see is are the Predators as big an underdog as say they were a couple years ago when they got in as the last seed I'm not sure that's going to be the case this time if they can stay playing the type of hockey they're playing right now well this is what you typically see especially um in sports that you know have a long season it's hard to kind of see it in football when you hire a new coach um you know it takes some time to really see the team sort of get itself immersed in what the coach actually wants and in football you really just don't have you know 20 25 games to try to you know figure it out usually yeah. if you figure it out it's a little bit too late and then you go into the next following season on a better note hockey baseball basketball is a little bit different when you get a new coach he changes the system he or she changes the system it's going to take you a minute it may take you that first half of the season and what you try to do is you try to just stay above water until you try to figure it all out and it seems like now with the way you see his plan the contribution they're getting from their, you know, the secondary scoring that they're getting, it seems like now they're figuring it out. And I said this to you, Willie, I think last week. I said, if they continue to play like this, and you mentioned it just a few minutes ago, if they continue to play this way, if they continue to get the play that they have gotten from UC Soros, I don't see them going into the playoff as an underdog. I think if they get you past that, no, because of the way they're playing. They may not have all the marquee players, but they're playing as a team and they're playing within the system. And they, it seems like now that UC is back on his game, it seems like everything else is coming into play. Not to say they figured everything out, but I think the core of it, they know, like Willie said, they know how to play in this brunette system now. And I think that's going to speak volumes once they get into the playoff. I believe, Willie, this is not going to be – if indeed they continue to play this way and get into the playoffs, I don't think it's going to be a surprise if they win a first-round game, I mean a first-round series. I really don't because they're playing like a team that can win a first-round series, at least to me. Well, I, I think anything can happen in the playoffs. When, when you take a look, Florida last year – Coach Barely Willie coming out. It. Coach Willie, like, taper well, it down, it. taper it. <laughs> right, right. Barely got in, the Panthers. Right? Played, uh -huh. played the Bruins, who, were, who had historically high numbers. Nobody had ever won as many games as they had in the salary cap era. They absolutely Those big, bad dominated. Bruins. Uh -huh. And Florida beat them in the, in the, in the first round. Uh, so upsets like that happen every year. Now, the Predators, I, one thing that you said really stood out to me, Derek, they are playing, you look at the names on the sheet, and outside of Philip Forsberg and Roman Yossi and UC Soros, you're not seeing all-stars. But you're seeing a team that is playing really well connected and together. And when you do that, you, you, can, beat, you can beat teams, right? It, there's not a huge difference in the league because of the hard salary cap. It's a lot more even than people realize. So it's the, it's the teams who can play together. 
Now the question is, can they keep moving this product? They're probably at some point going to cool off a little bit, right? They can't mm-hmm. just go undefeated. They're, it's amazing how they keep doing this. 11-0-2. I don't know how much longer it's going to go. And they still need more points just to qualify. But if they can take something close to this into the playoffs, I think they'll have a shot. I, 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 it, will be a sh- it will be a shock, I think, around the league if they knock off somebody like Vancouver or Colorado. I, I think it's really probably down to four teams they could play if they make it. And that would be Colorado, Dallas, Winnipeg, or Vancouver. It's going to be one of those four. And, and it's musical chairs in, in the Central Division. Colorado just got a huge come-from-behind win last night uh, to get up there. Nashville beating Winnipeg, knocked them down a little bit. Dallas blew a 3 nothing lead to Florida the other night and lost in overtime. So those three are really in a horse race uh, for the top spot. But just, So you're going to go up against one of the four best teams, I think, in the entire NHL in the first round. But I'm just I'm thinking... A little differently than I was a couple months ago when they were in the playoff spot, but you're thinking, huh, if they get in, it'd be great. It would just be a nice feather in the cap to be able to say you made it, but you would be a big underdog in a playoff series. Now, I mean, again, a lot can happen. There's injuries and all these things that can make your team look a lot different than they do today. But I'm just really encouraged about what they've been able to do here when they're clicking. And going into the season, Barry Trotz set the expectations very clearly and I think very fairly that we're going to try and win as many games as we possibly can. But our end goal is ultimately building a cup contending team and we're not there yet. So I think going into this season, Predators fans could live with the fact that maybe they won't make the playoffs and we're going to be okay with that. Mm -hmm. The Annie's been upped. The Annie has been upped. It's not just, oh, well, maybe we can find ourselves in the playoffs. Moneypuck.com gives the Predators an 89.8% chance of making the playoffs, 28.2% chance of getting to the second round of the playoffs. Willie, I know that this is probably so uncomfortable (laughs) for you to say, but Predators are a playoff team. They're playing that way. 89.8% chance of making the playoffs. Like, they're making the playoffs. Can't you say, Willie, it's just like it's just like your kid. If you, he or she goes into a new class and you sort of taper the expectations, whether it's a you know chemistry class or an algebra class, whatever it is, you taper the expectations because this is their first like algebra class or first chemistry class. But once they show you that they can do the work, you expect more of them moving forward. Yeah. That's the Nashville Predators. It was, man, you know, they're going to win as many games as they can. They may not make it to the playoffs. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, they're in the playoffs. Now they're showing us that they can beat top-ranked teams. So now we expect that from them moving forward. Expect is a, is a strong word. Uh, they, I, I do think the playoffs are different. But mm-hmm. as far as making the playoffs, there's 15 games left. They have 80 points. If they were to go 500, 7-7-1 seven, seven, in the last 15, that would put them at 95 points. That's going to be awfully tough for any of the teams below them to top. They're, they would have to be completely lights out. Now, as we've said, Minnesota has got a very soft part of their schedule uh, for the next couple of weeks. In fact, uh, in the Blues won last night, there's actually two games between the Blues and Minnesota. You'd, almost, you'd really prefer them to split th- those two games. That would be nice so that one team doesn't grab all four points because, really, that's, that's what it would take. One, one team to go on an, an incredible run and the Predators to play less than 500 uh, between now and the, and the end of the season. And that, you know, thing, stuff happens. A lot can happen in about a month. You still have a month to play before the playoffs get going. But right now, they're just going to keep their head down and, and keep doing their thing uh, because their thing right now is – is, it's really fun to watch, which is really what it is. I mean, you look at the Michael McCarron's line with Sherwood and, and Smith. Like, every line's got their own little identity, and they all sort of do the same. They do their job, and it, it really grinds and wears teams down. And, and Winnipeg had no answers last night. It is fun. I think that's the perfect like, – that's the, like the only word that I could use to summarize this Predators team, what, since the 9-2 butt whooping against the Stars about a month ago. <laughs> It's just been fun. It's yeah. a fun brand of hockey. 
it's fun to watch this team go from where they were, where it was ups and downs and highs and lows and inconsistencies to now a big enough sample size to say that they have consistently been playing their best hockey of the season. It's fun to have games that matter. It's fun to have the hype and the anticipation in this month of the year. You don't want a hockey games that, you know, it's just, all right, let's just finish out the season and, and move forward. No, you want games that matter on March 14th. You want games that matter in mid to late March. And right now, these games matter for the Nashville Predators. And it is just freaking fun. And it, like Willie said, Andrew Burnett will join us in just over 10 minutes. And this isn't me just stroking the ego of Andrew Burnett before he comes on our program. Mm -hmm. I talked about how Barry Trotz's expectations going into the season, as we have talked about ad nauseum that Predators fans are well aware of, was, look, we're going to try our best. If that's enough to squeak into the playoffs, then great. And if it's not, then we're going to still move forward and we're going to do what we can to keep building this team. That was a, a true and honest evaluation and fair expectation set by Barry Trotz. I don't think that that was, let's set the bar low so anything above that is, is, is exceeding expectations. No, I think that was a true and fair evaluation of Barry's team. Yeah. So I have to give a lot of credit to Andrew Burnett because the coaching job that Andrew Burnett has done this season, yeah. this team that it was, <laughs> I know Sean Henry's fired up about it. He's fired up about how these Predators are playing. Well, But the coaching job he, that he has done so far this season has, has been very impressive. I'll tell you, if, if they can get, get an X by their name, mm -hmm. I, I believe, and so keep, keep getting the work done, get in there. I really believe he should get strong consideration for the Jack Adams Trophy for Coach of the Year. I don't know if he's going to win it. Uh, I think it's been under the radar largely until very recently. Uh, but the job he has done has been remarkable. Now, when he comes on, you guys know how he is. He's very even keeled. He's not going to get too high or too low, right? He's That's just how he rolls. But uh, I And he's not going to sing his own praises by any stretch. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, this is a guy that had a huge year. President Trophy year when he took over the Florida Panthers as the interim coach after that whole fallout of Joel Quenville. He got nominated for the Jack Adams, and they didn't even keep him as the head coach. Mm. So that has driven Hockey's him. Hockey's crazy. For sure. Then, yeah, and then the, then the Devils hire him as assistant coach. They have an unreal year last year with him uh, as the right-hand man for Lindy Ruff. They kept Lindy Ruff. They didn't, and, and you know, that would have been a tough thing to move Lindy Ruff, a very respected veteran coach aside for Andrew Burnett but I think a lot of people in New Jersey are going hmm did we make a mistake letting the the real brains behind the real you know force behind how well that team played last year did we let him get away and and so it's really remarkable what what Burnett is doing here it's ahead yeah. of schedule I think is oh more I, I than think, fair I, to say I think they're ahead of, ahead of schedule and um you know and and, and Willie not only uh, Coach Bruno for the Jack Adams Award. Uh, and I know we, listen, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, and I understand that, but they're, this team is, is, is playing well. They're playing really good. They're one of the hottest teams in the National Hockey League. But not only um, Coach Bruno, but what about Barry Trotz, you know, GM of the year, what he's been able to do with this team. And it started, even though Poyle was still in, it, it, Poyle was still in the seat, but it started last, you know, toward the end of last season. And now it has bled over into this season. And what he's been able to do, the move he's made, um, he has to be a guy that has to be recognized as one of the, you know, better young GMs in, in, in the National Hockey League. I, I agree with you. And, and it's so subjective uh, mm -hmm. how that gets that gets calculated, uh, the who's the best coach, who's the best GM. But... There's no doubt that when Barry Trotz took the podium and kind of unveiled what he wants, he, he's pretty much accomplished to this point everything he hoped to accomplish. You know, has, has the, you know, the winning culture, the veterans who are a good um, influence on the younger players. Uh, he has not disrupted the future. He has kept all of the resources down on the farm basically intact. It's been a mixed bag of what young players. In fact, they're they're a little bit of an older team now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with with Glass sitting out and with Parson and Tomasino down. They're a little more veteran than people realize now. But I still think the future is bright 
for what's happened in Milwaukee. Milwaukee now is going through a little bit of adversity, right? Uh, a scar off was pulled yesterday uh -huh. after giving up four goals. So that's probably a good thing in the big picture. You got to go through some tough times to come out the other side. But so I think there's a lot of uh, growing still to be done with that young group in Milwaukee. But uh, so you've got layers of, of how you're building it here. And there's still a, far, a long way from reaching the goals that he wants. Mm -hmm. But so far, I think everything he said he wants to map out, you, you can see that, pro that progress. You can see it coming to fruition. It makes sense. The moves that he made at the trade deadline, I think they make sense. Not an overwhelming buyer, not an overwhelming seller. So it's two pieces. It's, it's Barry Trotz having a vision for the team, executing moves that align with that vision, and also executing moves that align with Andrew Burnett's system. And it's credit to Andrew Burnett to bring this team together that had gone from one system to another. Like Roman Yosu, I think, is the perfect you know, poster child for that transition <laughs> of systems. He struggled a little bit at yeah. the beginning of the season. Two assists last night. I mean, Roman, Ho Roman Yosi has been playing the best hockey in the last few weeks than he has this entire season. So it's, it's clicking. Keep it going throughout the rest of the season. Still plenty of hockey left to be played, but 89.8% chance of making the playoffs. I'll take my chances on that. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. We'll get into your thoughts, your reaction on those Predators and what they did taking down Winnipeg 4-2 to last night. Head coach Andrew Burnett will join us coming up next. Caroline Willie D. Mays, we're brought to you by Zen Sports. Start earning cash rewards on your bets today. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-889-9789. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 or older and in Tennessee to bet. All right, let's talk loan pronto. One of the things they've been talking about, and they can make it happen in a hurry, and that is being 100% debt-free from credit card bills or high-interest loans that are bogging you down. You might not even realize it. You might just look at your monthly bill statement and say, okay, I owe you know, this amount of money over here, and here's my bill for my car, and I play that. But if you look at your interest rates, and they are up there 8 9 10%, maybe even more, don't get bogged down with that. Get those payments down to zero through Loan Pronto's Express Equity line of credit because your home value is up and you can use that value to get a better deal by getting cash out of your home's equity and then using that cash to attack those bills and get them down to zero. Or you can take that cash and reinvest in your home, make it even more valuable with a home improvement project. Approval is just minutes away with one phone call. If you like this idea, call now and find out more. 615-499-5780. That's 615-499-5780 or go to LoanPronto.com. The rate will be better through this. LoanPronto.com. NMLS 166-1781. Subject to lender approval. Equal housing lender.
Next, Willie D. Mace, a little bit of breaking news. This just coming in from John Rothstein, college basketball insider for CBS Sports. Quote, sources, barring an unforeseen set of circumstances, Jerry Stackhouse is not expected to return as Vanderbilt's head coach next season. I don't know what those unforeseen set of circumstances could be, but that coming in from John Rothstein, Jerry Stackhouse not expected to be back at Vanderbilt next season. We'll react to that. Plus, Tennessee Titan new free agents are being introduced as we speak. Tony Pollard is up at the podium. We will react to that as well. But now joining us is Predators head coach Andrew Burnett coming off of that 4-2 win in Winnipeg. First and foremost, Coach, appreciate you for joining us. I want to talk about this this full streak that you've had the last month of play, but just focusing in on last night. Winnipeg, one of the top teams in the league, a Stanley Cup contender. You go into their arena and you, uh, you dominate them really for a majority of that game. Was that a measuring stick kind of game to see where your team is compared to the top teams in the league? Well, I think it was, it was going to be a test. It was going to test us in all the different facets of our game. Um, test us, are we going as good as we think we're going? And, uh, you know, we go in a little bit of hostile environment. Being in Winnipeg is a tough place to play. Uh, it was really, you know, the way we started, I think it was really proud of that group that we, we set the tone right away. And that building, that's hard to do. There's a lot of games you get out of there in the first, by the first TV timeout, you're down 2 nothing. So you can say a little bit of a measuring stick. For me, it's just the, the growth of our group. And, and we're still trying to build our game so it's airtight. And um, that was a good step. And like you said, it was a test at every facet. Coach Andrew Burnett is with us. After that 9-2 to loss against Dallas, that this Predators team looked different. You know, the eight-game winning streak, the point streak. You've been beating some of the top teams in the league. What changed? Well, I think, in, you know, I think in fairness of, of what had happened, we had, we had that long uh, break, you know, and some teams are still playing. We get out of the break and kind of lost our game a little bit, which is normal. Uh, it's always the coach's biggest fear after a 10-day, 9-day break. And yeah. we just kind of, you know, in, in fairness to, to everything, we just we weren't sharp. And we played some teams and didn't like the game right from the start. And you play one, then you have two days off, and it was a Super Bowl. And we just we kind of just got lost a little bit. So, um, I don't know what really changed because I thought we were playing pretty good hockey up to the up to the break. I think we just had to find our game back, and we had to dig in a little deeper, and we had to be a little bit more connected. Um, we had to pull the same rope. We had to come together as a group and go through a little adversity, and I think that was healthy for us. I, I, through the course of the season, we hadn't really gone through adversity, and that was a major test. And credit to the group, the veterans, the leadership, the players. You know, it could go a couple different ways after Dallas, and it went the way that uh, – prove to the whole organization that, hey, we're, we're in this to win this, and we're going to rally together, and we're going to move forward here straight ahead. We'll talk with Nashville's Predators head coach, Andrew Brunette. Now, Coach, um, how do you coach a team through the trade deadline? Because obviously, um, you know, some players may be gone, one or two here, but then you may be adding players. But how do you continue to keep guys, you know, within – the framework of the game, keep them concentrated on the game because of all, knowing all of the stuff that is going around um, outside of the team in regards to the trade talk. Yeah, that's a hard one. I mean, I, I think you, you've been through, we've all been through playing. It's, it's tough. The distractions are at a different level. We were kind of on that cusp of maybe getting the playoffs, maybe not. Are we going to buy or sell? So I think there's a lot of noise that goes around um, the room. I thought we did a good job of keeping it tight. I think we kept our focus just on our, our game um, and everybody together. But it is hard. There's no easy, you know, I can't say that we did a great job of it or a poor job of it. We don't know. You know, it's, it's, a, tar it's a tough time of year uh, for the players individually. But I think we try to keep it as a collective group and collaborate with them, communicate with them, let them know where we're at, and, and just worry about hockey. And I think when you're a veteran in, in a league, you understand that, that this happens every year. And, and the only thing you can do, the only thing that really benefits you is, is your own game and how you play and how we play collectively as a group. You know, we pushed through and got into a position that we added. Obviously, we lost a pretty important piece in, in, in uh, Yakov Trenin, but we added some pretty good players. And I think that energizes the group. I think it gives a little bit of a fresh, you know, a new fresh start. And, hey, we're in this to try to win this. Now, is there a timetable on when a team – picks up on you know what you're coaching them because you've been to several different places 
And, you know, when you come in as a new coach, you bring in a new system, you know it's going to take guys time to get used to that system. And it seems like that's what was happening with you, your team. And now it seems like they've gotten used to the system. They figured it out a little bit. Guys understand their role. But more importantly, your goalie, UC Soros, is playing fabulous right now. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of things are happening in a good way. I think as a coach, you know, you're never patient. You, you know, you try to say, okay, I'll be patient. I know it's going to take some time for us to grasp this. I know it's probably uncomfortable for the players that played a certain way for, for a few years or their whole lives. You never know. And it's a little bit different. You know, uh, it's a little, it's a hard kind of system to understand in, in certain ways. So you try to be patient, but, but it's hard. Um, and now I think you're seeing the players just realizing kind of what you're asking and why we're asking to do this. And, you know, they're, you know, they're kind of well-oiled right now. And in the understanding of, of what we're doing, it makes it a little easier. It takes the thinking, I guess, out of it, you know, as a player, if you're you're thinking, you're always a step behind. So right now, it's just we're just playing hockey. It makes it a little bit easier. And obviously, Juice has been and Lanks, our goaltending has been outstanding. And, and they maybe got overlooked here a little bit over the you know the course of the year, this last stretch. They're a huge reason why we're at where we are we are right now. We're talking to Andrew Burnett, head coach of the Nashville Predators. Big win last night over Winnipeg. Next up is the Seattle Kraken on Saturday night. And uh, Bruno, along those lines, you know, you look at this streak 11 0 and 2 and I, I you may disagree but I, I i wouldn't circle any of those games as flukes right, right where you got you had your goaltender have to stand on his head and make 45 saves to, to win so when you look at that and and you look at what this team is putting out when they when they're all connected and playing together is that giving them a little more confidence of this isn't just a team that could sneak into the playoffs but maybe go into the playoffs and feel like you've got a chance when you when you see what it's up when you see what you can do when you when you play the way you did against a team like Winnipeg or Colorado here recently or some other examples yeah no I think we've through the stretch I think we got what we deserved um maybe even maybe even a you know game here that maybe we we didn't get what we deserved and I think we've we've played like you said connected the transition of, of we have the puck a lot most nights and I think we're understanding if we're willing to put the work in, you'll have the puck a little bit more. And when you have the puck a little bit more, it's more fun. So I think we're, we're creating, um, we're playing in your face fast. Uh, there's not a, we take away time and space. So we're doing a lot of good things that we talk about, but it's been a good stretch. Like you said, Willie, that we, we haven't really, you know, and it's going to, we're going to go through a little adversity here again, and we're going to need, you know, certain nights where a goalie has to make 50 saves to win the hockey game. Um, but as of now, I think, when we're playing this style in this way right now, we put ourselves in a pretty good position to try to be able to win every night. I, I saw the guys, and you were wearing one as well in Winnipeg, and a lot of people were looking at the hat says relentless, right? And that, I think anybody who's been watching the team can see, you know, that that word. But why why that word? Because I, I, I think of a guy like Kiefer Sherwood and the way he's played during this stretch. And you watch him every shift. You can see exactly what we're talking about. Where where did that kind of come up, though? That word. Well, I think it's just something that we, you know, I think preached all season long um, that we want to be relentless, relentless on the pucks, relentless on the way we play, relentless on the the tracking back, relentless on the work ethic, relentless when we're down a game, relentless when we're up a game. So I think the word sort of we built our identity a little bit around the word uh, without even thinking about it. It was just a word, um, but I think. It came to caught my eye the more, you know, I watched and, and seeing and, and seeing Mike McCarron and Cole Smith. I mean, those guys and Kiefer Sherwood, they are relentless um, in the way they play. If you look at Phil, you know, um, F- Factor, Gus, they're relentless. Now you're looking at Novi and Bench and, and Janko, they're relentless. So I think the whole group, you know, collectively has grabbed it. And, and just watching it really stuck out. So I think that's where it came from not premeditated, not anything like that. I think it was just eye-opening here, especially the last, you know, 13, 15 games, or not 15, but 13 games, where when I'm watching video the next morning, that's what I said, the word always pops out. So it was just a good reminder that when you lose your game, you got to be relentless right away to get it back. Uh, I, tell me about Sherwood specifically, because here's a guy that has spent a lot of time in the AHL. He's had some some partial seasons with some different organizations. And you can just tell the way he's wired. You know, he'll do anything to, to get to that next level and stay in the league. He knows 
he's got to be relentless to, to be in there. He was going through a stretch where he wasn't super productive, and then he was sort of the odd man out on a lot of nights. And now he's really found his spot. What, what do you see from him and that perseverance? That it kind of it, It's really inspiring. Yeah, I agree. You know, totally. And he'll do – I mean, he wants it so bad. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's certain days he almost feel – you know, when he was going through the, the, the stretch where he wasn't maybe playing up to his capabilities, you, you felt bad because he would do anything. He just kind of lost his game. And we, we had a few guys that lost that all at the same time. And I think, you know, they weren't there to kind of lift each other up and help each other. So our middle six kind of, we, we, you know, we weren't really, you know, we were struggling to find any kind of anybody with a little bit of, you know, playing at top of their level. And he had to come out. Um, you know, maybe he was in a position earlier, maybe an offensive position just wasn't working. Then we put him into like a little bit of a hound dog position and he relished in it. And he's been, again, that line has kind of been the identity of our group here through this stretch that, that we're going to bring that. And they all have that attitude, that hound dog mentality. And they're on top of pucks and there's no space and they're physical. And they've really pushed us. You know, I start that line every game. They've pushed us through this stretch and helped us, as a group, find our game. And, and they're the ones that, you know, some of the leaders of doing that. Last thing for me, I, Jason Zucker scores last night. You go way back with him. Uh, it just, he's only been with the team a few days, but you can see that he's a veteran. You know, he says all the right things. He's a team guy. But uh, how quickly do you think he can pick up what you guys are doing? And, and you've got a guy in Colton Sissons that you've kind of charged with him and Anthony Bavillier, kind of bring these guys up to speed. He's a, sort of that glue guy that can help that process. Yeah, Sis is, is great. I mean, and he's, he's so underrated for what he brings every day, every, every game, where, how he is in the locker room, his leadership ability. And, yeah, he's, uh, for me, he's a real comfort blanket. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, you feel bad. Sometimes you've got to do some things that probably, you know, probably carrying too much load. You're always worried about a little fatigue. But, no, he's good. You know, and with Jason, you know, Jason's a great guy, great kid. I've, I've had him for so long. Um, He's really competitive, as you've seen. He's been on some really good teams. He's, he's scored some big goals. Um, he knows how to win. And I think he'll catch on to the system. I think he, he's such a great skater, and he's got a pretty good understanding. In Pittsburgh, it's a little bit similar, you know, and he'll get, he'll get it. And same with Bolt. I mean, they're really good skaters. It's going to take a little time. I keep telling that. It's going to be strange. I'm asking you to, you know, you're probably wondering why I'm asking you to do this, but just, just be patient trust it, you know, watch, learn, ask questions, and you'll get there. They're both smart players. They're good hockey players, and they got good, they got good wheels, so they should fit in pretty easily here. Predators head coach Andrew Burnett. Andrew, really appreciate your time, and thanks for joining us. Safe travels back from Seattle this weekend. I appreciate it. Anytime. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it. Predators head coach Andrew Burnett. Appreciate him for stopping by. Coming up next, I want to get Willie's reaction to the breaking news. This just coming in from John Rothstein of CBS Sports. The Vanderbilt Commodores are moving on from Jerry Stackhouse. We'll get into that coming up next. We'll get your reaction as well. 615-737-1025 is our phone number live out here at BetMGM Sports Lounge. And we are broadcasting from the Spring Hill Heating and Cooling Game Nashville Studios, keeping your home feeling comfortable all year round.
first reported by John Rothstein, college basketball insider for CBS Sports, and since confirmed by several other sources, Vanderbilt is expected to part ways with head basketball coach Jerry Stackhouse. I thought last night was a toughie for Vanderbilt. 14-point lead over Arkansas. They ultimately end up dropping that one in overtime. Vanderbilt's season ended last night. Willie, you're a Vandy fan. Your reaction to the news that Vanderbilt is parting ways with Jerry Stackhouse? Well, you know, for, for Coach Stackhouse, I, I will say, I, you know, he's always treated me as a former player very, very well. Uh, and so I, I hate to see anybody lose their job you know that's that's just how the business works but I, as I've said really throughout this season where they've really struggled you know whether they won that game or not last night I think it was really a collapse and and, and when you when you have six years and look you know me I think they should have made the tournament last year I think they got a raw deal from the committee uh, but even so to go from where they were the last couple of years where I really did think they were moving it forward and on the verge of some good things to have it dip so low this year in year six was alarming. Uh, and I, I'll be honest, I'm a little I'm a little surprised because I had heard some rumblings that they, they were going to try to give it one more shot yeah. and really kind of put it to next year and say it's got to happen next year or, or else. Um, but they have made the decision, and, and, and look, I, I look at social media and the, the Vanderbilt fans, they're hungry, they're frustrated, and I think, you know, they were, they were probably at a point where they wanted to see a change, and, and so I'm not, I'm not against this move as much as I like Coach Stackhouse, and I wish him well, because I think he's a really good coach. I think the bottom line is he just didn't have enough good players. I think you give him equal talent, I think that guy is going to coach his way to a lot of wins. And I, I do wonder what's next for him. Well, I mean, it, it's not surprising um, that they they are relieving him of his duties. Uh, he was 20, what, 28 and 60 or 26 and 60 in the SEC over that span. Now, last season, they did go 11 and 7, which improved from 70 and 11 to the following the uh, previous year. Yeah. But we thought that last year was going to be a sign of what we could possibly see entering into this season and we just didn't see it for whatever reason i do agree with you willie that if he has the players then i think he's a good coach but i mean you got to put part of that on him why he doesn't have the players what aren't what didn't he do to try to go out and get the players was it all nil uh if that's the case then you know it's not just He's at fault. Those that, you know, are part of the sort of um, athletic department could be at fault. The alumni could be at fault. Boosters, if you want to field a team nowadays, Willie, and, and this is just the way the, the landscape of college sports is, period, whether yeah. it's football, basketball, baseball, whatever. If you want the players, you got to pay for them, especially if you don't have that steep, rich, true history uh, or tradition of winning, not just winning, but winning championships. When you are a team that's good sometimes, not, you know, you may go on a run where you have some good seasons. When you're a team or a university like that, a program like that, you have to pay for the players. And they, right. it just didn't happen. So don't, don't think that firing Jerry Stackhouse, things are going to change. Because if you keep doing the same things, the same things are going to happen until you realize that this is professional sports now. And if you want a team, you got to buy a team. That's just the way it is. I, think I, I agree. NIL is going to be a part of the equation going forward. And, and that will be a big question for the next coach is what, what do I have to work with? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think if there's a knock on Jerry Stackhouse, I do think that he was not cut from the cloth of a lot of college coaches who came up through the ranks as the recruiter mm -hmm. that is in everybody's living room at every court watching every game and searching and searching for the right players. I mean, it, it, because he was a great player, right? He was a great NBA player for a long time. He was an NBA developmental league coach. And this was kind of the question from the very beginning is when he came from that world, could he get into, a uh, you know, that recruiting world 
And if he couldn't do it himself, would he have two or three people on his staff that did have that ability to just find the right players aside from the NIL? And now it makes it even, worse, uh, even tougher because it's a unique place to recruit to at Vanderbilt. The degree means something. You've got to like to go to school, right? You're not coming to Vanderbilt and not going to class. That's just how it is, right? Yeah. The, the coach has to accept that. Uh, but I think if there's one knock, I don't think Jerry Stack has really enjoyed that part of it uh and he wasn't like i said developed as a coach that way he's more hey give me the players i'll develop them at practice i think he really excelled in that area but uh the formula wasn't quite enough uh for him to get over the top i wish jerry stackhouse nothing but the best but this was the right move yeah vanderbilt fans know what it is like to be at the top of the college basketball world We've seen what Memorial Magic can be or what it was, and it's gotten away from that. And I think the biggest indictment on Jerry Stackhouse was that the fans didn't have hope. It's one thing to lose a lot of games and to be bounced in the first round of the conference tournament, but you could say, hey, we have a lot of really young players that we feel good about. We have all these recruits coming in that we feel really excited about. I don't think that Vanderbilt fans had that sense of hope and excitement moving forward, that it wasn't just give them a couple more years and look what this basketball program can be. That's run out, and it's a really competitive league, and it's a league that's only getting better. So I wish nothing but the best for Jerry Stackhouse, but intrigued to see where Vanderbilt goes from here. Yeah. Right, the tight- because it's complete unknown for, for next year as well. I think yeah. that's the other thing that made it hard to, to say, okay, give them another year because – I, I don't think there's anybody coming back that you're saying, let, let's let's build a team around these two or three guys. You don't have yeah. that. And, and so you're really starting from scratch. And so if you're going to start from scratch, why not have a, a change at the top? And at a certain point, it, the one more year, just one more year, just one more year, that, that starts to run out. That, that, that messaging starts to get stale. All right, coming up next, the Titans have made two signings. Calvin Ridley is a Tennessee Titan. Mason Rudolph as well, going to be the backup going into this season. Tim Hasselbeck, ESPN NFL analyst, will join us coming up next to react to those moves and moves across the NFL. Caroline Willie D. Mace, we are live from the BetMGM Sports Lounge at Bridgestone Arena. And tune into 102.5 and 106.3 The Game for updates of the SEC Men's Basketball Tournament, tipping off here in just a few minutes. Presented by ESPN Bet Sportsbook, Toyota, and Guinness.
Caroline, Willie, D. Mays, 1025-1063, The Game and The Game Nashville app. We're, we are streaming live on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook Live every single day. And today we are live at the BetMGM Sports Lounge at Bridgestone Arena. The SEC tournament is now underway. LSU and Mississippi State just tipped off just a few seconds ago. And the Titans... Ranta Claus bringing us a wide receiver. Titan signed Calvin Ridley yesterday afternoon. Four-year deal worth up to $92 million. $50 million of that is guaranteed. And joining us now to react to all things free agency is Tim Hasselbeck, ESPN NFL analyst and, of course, head coach of the Endsworth Tigers. Tim, appreciate you for joining us. First and foremost, your reaction to the Calvin Ridley signing. And do you think that that could perhaps shift the Titans draft approach in terms of going after a receiver with the first two picks in the draft? Um, I definitely think it could impact it. I guess my first reaction uh, to the signing is, look, I, I think that Ridley's a good player. Um, he's one of these guys that I think he's, um, you know, I, I would, I think it's fair to say he's a complete receiver, meaning um, looking get off the press. He's got good long speed. You can play him inside. Um, you can play him outside, certainly. Um, so I, I think that, you know, because of his ability and versatility, I think that you could definitely say that, you know, signing him and then paying him what they're paying him, um, yeah, that it absolutely could impact the draft strategy. We're talking with Tim Hasselbeck and looking at the Calvin Ridley signing, four years, $92 million, 50 guaranteed. It kind of sounds to me like a two-year, $25 million deal, and after two years you go from there. Was it an overpay? Well, I think that I think it's a lot of money. I think all these wide receivers are making a lot of money. I think the part that probably um, that you would look at it, like I think, I think Calvin Ridley is just, um, just inside 30 years old. Um, you know, I think, and not to keep going back, at some point we, you know, got to move on from it all. But, like, you know, if you look at A.J. Brown, his age, the deal he was signed to, that and that it probably would have made sense to, to sign A.J. Brown and have him on, you know, not a two-year deal that had $50 million, you know, in guaranteed money tied to it, but, uh, you know, a longer-term deal with that, Look, you like like a real four or five year contract. So, like, like do they overpay for him? I mean, the market has changed. The cap's gone up. Um, can he be a number one wide receiver? I believe that he can. So, but at the same time, like if you were to, con, you know, contrast that to, you know, a guy that they had drafted who they had on a rookie deal who's twenty six years old. Um, yeah, I could feel like that a little bit. We'll talk with Tim Masterback, ESPN NFL analyst and head coach of the Innsworth Tigers. Now, now that they've acquired um, Calvin Ridley, you look at their um, skill guys, and I'm not going to go too far into depth-wise, but you have um, D-Hop, you have Ridley now, Traylon Burks, Chica Conquil, um, you've got Pollard and Spears, and then you have a young quarterback. Where – how do you rank this offense just with those guys, knowing what Houston has done, knowing what Jacksonville has done and what they may continue to do, but they lose Ridley, so they may be set back in that regards. They go out and get Gabe Davis, but it's Gabe Davis, Calvin Ridley. We don't know yet. Or he may end up being better than Calvin Ridley in that offense. But where do you stack up this Tennessee's offense and them getting Cushionberry? Where do you stack up this Tennessee offense right now? Yeah, I mean, here's what I would say. It's like, I, I think DeAndre Hopkins, um, you know, w the type of player that he is now, I mean, I think that there's certainly value there. Look, I, I just said I think Calvin Ridley has the ability to be a number one wide receiver. Uh, Traylon Burks has had his moments. Um, I think Chick Okonkwo is a really talented player. And, and then Tony Pollard is – um, you know, a young, explosive player. So, like, I, I think there are really, really good players um, on the offense. But I think it's fair to say that, like, you just go around the division and, uh, and you can kind of make that similar argument, you know, in terms of the players that 
are around the quarterback. And so what that ends up, you know, kind of meaning is that I think a lot of it depends on where you think the quarterback is. So let's just take, for example, um, the Houston Texans. Well, like Nico Collins had a good year. Tank uh, Dell had a really good year. So, like, that, that's two um, young receivers that have played well. Robert Woods, like you can kind of say, even though he's a different receiver, like maybe he's the DeAndre Hopkins type role. Dalton Schultz, you know, is probably a comp to uh, Chig. And then when you look at, um, you know, their running back situation, they added Joe Mixon. So, and that's what he say, like, all right, do you like, the quarterback in Houston or in Tennessee more. So I think it's fair to say that, you know, across the board, there's going to be comparable talent everywhere. I think the real question now ends up being, what about the quarterback? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right, because I think everything is going to boil down to whether Will Levis, you know, builds on what he did last year or will he take a step back? We're talking with Tim Hasselbeck, ESPN NFL analyst. Now, Tim, I'm still wondering about, you know, how do they, meaning the Tennessee Titans, proceed? Because, you know, at the beginning of this, before they got Calvin Ridley, you know, the fan base was screaming, he needs to spend more money, Rand needs to spend more money. And then he goes out and get Ridley, and it seems like all of a sudden now the noise has quieted just a little bit. Why is it hard to get fans to understand that, hey, listen, you cannot build this in a day. You cannot build Rome in a day. We cannot build this roster back up in a day. It's going to take time. Free agency didn't even start, and fans were complaining that the Titans were not spending money. <laughs> and and we, we didn't even get into free agency yet. I think the reason for it is, is the team's – I mean, the team hasn't been great for a while. I mean, I think it, it's, it's that simple. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people talk about you know, the draft and what we think the Titans are going to do. And what do you think is going to happen to free agency? What's going to happen with Derrick Henry? And what's going to, you know, who do you think the quarterback is going to be? And all of that stuff, right? And, um, like, and then they talk about how, like, look, it's been a while since the team's been good. And you've really been able to enjoy success in the team, especially with kind of how things started off, you know, for the Titans. If you're somebody that's been, you know, a fan of the team for, you know, 20 years or so. So I think that that ends up being, you know, why there's um, so much kind of impatience. I think it's the time of year where, you know, you look around and you say, okay, well, like, it seems like, you know, hey, Russell Wilson's going to Pittsburgh. Is that going to help them? And, hey, Kirk Cousins is on his way to Atlanta. And look how that's going to help them. Like, hey, what are we doing? Right? I think that, you know, there's this, comparison as well that makes you makes you a little bit uneasy to say okay we're doing all that and oh by the way now that things have started yeah Derrick Henry he's now with Lamar Jackson and we know that Baltimore is really good and uh you know you look at a team like the Chiefs like they're good every year and so you just wonder like hey where do you fit in Tim Hasselbeck is with us talking some NFL football all right Tim uh, the Mason Rudolph signing. I guess I was not uh, thinking about him that much, but I, I looked at his numbers late in the season where he got to play and even played in the playoff game. He wasn't bad. Uh, so if you're just looking at him as the backup, it looks like a, a solid choice. Uh, what do you know about him, the person? Like, and, and what could he maybe do to help a young quarterback like Will Levis? I think he's got a good perspective because how his career has gone. Remember, he was in that ugly incident with uh, Miles Garrett uh, as a very young player. He was probably kind of thrown into the mix a little bit with Ben Roethlisberger in a way that maybe wasn't great for his career. I actually thought when he was coming out of um, Oklahoma State, I thought he was the best deep ball thrower in the draft that year. Um, I actually thought that he was good enough to be a late first-round pick. Um, I thought that's kind of the the type of prospect he looked like at the time. Um, And I think as a guy and as a person, I think he's matured. I think he's had a lot of experience playing, watching, being being the starter, being the backup, being the third guy for a guy that, you know, hasn't been in the league for all that long. Um, He's been around a number of different players. I think that's a, that's a good thing for his perspective at this point. I think he has an appreciation for the opportunity to play 
but also understands that, you know, that's not always your role every single week. Um, I think that's a good thing for the Titans. Um, but I do think this. He, is, he, to me, is not a guy that has kind of resigned himself to being a backup for the rest of his career. I just don't think that that's his makeup or how he sees himself. And, and I think that's okay considering the situation that he's come into. But, look, I, I don't want to say he's not going to be helpful to uh, Will Levis because I think that he probably will be because I do think his experience probably has shaped uh, how he will treat a guy that's the presumed starter. Um, all that to say, I think that he probably – is looking at this as an opportunity to say, if I get a chance to play, I'm going to keep this job. That, that's interesting to mention that because we've had those discussions about when, when a guy is signed. And I wonder what, uh, what, what was talked about as they negotiated that deal. Hey, Mason, we're bringing you in to be the backup. Or did they give him a hint that, hey, if this kid struggles, he's unproven, who knows what could happen? You know, there's different ways you could couch it to sell him on coming to Nashville, but I, I don't know what else was out there for Mason Rudolph. Yeah, well, listen, I, I think he'll be one of the better backups in the league. I don't think there's any question that he'll be per, perceived as that. Um, and I would just say this, in terms of, um, like I was looking at the deal that he signed, he basically signed a one-year, um, you know, $2.87 million deal. And so, what did he do? He signed to be the backup. Like, that's what he did. And, and really, he signed to be the backup on, you know, not like elite backup money. You know, if, if like, you know, as a comparison, you know, if you look at, I don't know, Drew Locke would be somebody that I think you could say, like, I mean, I would say that I think that he's better than Drew Locke. Drew Locke signed a one-year $5 million deal with the Giants. So to be, to be a backup, right? Um, so I guess what I, I mean, I think it's a good deal for the Titans um, economically. I think he definitely is the, is the backup quarterback based on how they paid him. So there certainly were no assurances, um, you know, in terms of anything else. And then, you know, for him, if he plays great, he's up and he gets an opportunity to either be in Tennessee or, or be somewhere else. I think it's a really interesting perspective that w when you point out that he's not, it's not like he's 36 years old, right, and said, okay, I'll, I'll be the Steve DeBerg, right, I'll just be right. the backup, then maybe I'll never play. He probably chose Tennessee looking at it, say, I'll take a little less money, but here's a young guy, his career could go in a lot of different directions. He'll probably try to say the right things, but he's probably also privately saying, look, he's got a little bit of an injury history, and he's a little unproven. Maybe this is a place where I could restart my career if things fall a certain way. I don't think there's any doubt. I mean, and look, I, as I looked up the, the money, I have to say, like, I'm surprised that he's making less money than Drew Locke. Like, I mean... And I think it easily could have been, I don't know this, in terms of like, hey, what else was out there? But if you're a guy that's a, a backup quarterback looking for a landing spot, but you're itching to play because you think you can, I mean, find me, a, find me a better environment than the Titans. But, I mean, <laughs> it might be the best one. Because especially when you think about like the places that are – you know, most likely going to draft a quarterback. So, um, yeah, I, I think when you look at that and you and you think about, you know, where a guy is and, and, and then also from the player's perspective, like what you think of yourself and what you're trying to accomplish. You know, the Giants situation, think about Drew Locke. He goes there, you, you know, they, they already have a quarterback on the roster that, you know, there's probably some kind of uncertainty with but maybe they're going to be committed to him. But there's also a really good chance that within the first five picks of the draft that they're drafting a quarterback. So, you know, that's very different, I think, than the situation in Tennessee. Um, in regards to um, two teams, Tim, 
Minnesota, not Minnesota, but Atlanta. Signing Kirk Cousins, uh, where does that put them in the NFC? And then looking at Houston, what they did from a free agency standpoint, do you think more teams are going to be inclined to do that, meaning have the rookie quarterback still under the rookie contract but trying to aggressively, and I mean aggressively, build around them and maybe even, you know, overpaying for individuals because you're trying to build a team while the young quarterback is still under his rookie deal? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I think if you know that a rookie quarterback can play, mm-hmm. that I get it, you know, or, you know, a guy on his rookie deal can play, then, then go ahead and go all in. At the same time, like if you are, you know, a team like – Atlanta, and you say, "Look, we know all these other guys around them can play. We've drafted, you know, rookie, you know, young quarterbacks, and they just haven't turned out to be as good as we thought that they would be. And so, like, what do we have to do at this point? Like, what we have to do is go get the guy that throws, you know, thirty touchdowns and ten picks and over four thousand yards every year, and pair him with it. So, you know, I, I just think that." You know, we, I think we do this sometimes like, what's the right way to do it? You know, what's the right way to build it? Or if you could do it, how would you do it? And, you know, I think that if we're really being honest about, you know, these teams that find a young quarterback that everybody looks and goes, yep, you know what? You can win a Super Bowl with that guy. I think it's fair to say that, like, everyone in, to, to a certain degree – has dumbed into that. And and I and I mean that like not in a not really meant to be in a negative way, but like did everyone know that CJ Stroud was going to be that good and they should just go ahead and like put the chips in the middle of the table and build around him right away? They didn't know that, which is why he got drafted where he got drafted. The same thing with um you know when you look around like Brock Purdy for that matter or you know any of these young guys that have played well where you say hey Let's hurry up and, and build around him. I don't think you really know until that guy plays for a year or two. Tim Hasselbeck is with us. Tim, the Titans have reportedly been in conversations with the Chiefs about cornerback Legereus Need. He's been tagged by the Chiefs, but the Chiefs have granted him permission to seek a trade. The reported asking price is a third round pick. The Titans don't have a third round pick in this upcoming draft. So it would be a 2025 third. I would be shocked and floored if a 2025 third would be all that it would take to trade for luxurious need. What do you think the asking price is? And if you're the Titans, what should you be willing to offer to trade for luxurious need? Yeah, that seems super low to me, even if it was a third this year. Um, Because, you know, you're going to end up getting him under contract. Um, you know, I guess it. I think part of it end, ends up being like, like, do you think that? Do do you do you think that like he, if you're Kansas City, do you think that he's going to be such a disaster in terms of not wanting to play? Like, I'm looking it up now. He's 27 years old. So like, if you sign him to a four-year contract, like chances are you're still getting the best football out of him. So I'm I'm shocked that it, it wouldn't be more than that. So we're saying third-round pick, that seems low. Maybe it's a second. I think I told you guys last week or two weeks ago that I would guess that it would be a first-rounder for an elite corner, um, especially at his age and injury history. So – that would be shocking to me. Look, if the Titans could pull that off where it's anything less than giving up a, a first rounder and getting him on a four year deal, um, I think that would be the I mean that would be a win for the Titans. All right, last one for you, Tim, quickly. Derrick Henry to the Ravens. How scary is that offense gonna be? Yeah, I think it's gonna be scary. I'm I'm a little bit interested to see the fit, just to be candid about it. Like I think Derrick Henry you know, we know that he's big downhill runner. Once he gets going, it's hard to stop him. Um, I think a lot of that run game, while they do have, like, traditional power runs, there are a lot of reads associated with it because of, you know, how Lamar Jackson is, um, you know, as a runner. And so, I, you know, I don't think that every run scheme fits 
every single back and certainly not every run scheme fits Derrick Henry. And so um, I think it'll be somewhat interesting. Um, I really do. I'm, I'm not totally, totally sold on the volume of carry and fit for him. Fair point. Tim, great stuff. Appreciate you for joining us. And we'll catch up with you next week. Sounds good. See you guys. Awesome. Tim Hasselbeck, ESPN NFL analyst. Appreciate him for joining us. Great as always. Are coming up next. Calvin Ridley is a Tennessee Titan. What do we make of the signing? What do we make of the money? And what do we think that means for what the Titans could do at the wide receiver position? Does that change their offseason plan? We'll get into that coming up next. We'll get into your thoughts as well. Caroline, Willie, D. Mace. We're brought to you by Zen Sports. Start earning cash rewards. To bed.
We are seeing some rumblings from Ian's camera. There he is. He's been. Ooh. Yes. And look. Here we go. All right. You want a bombshell? Lay it out, brother. You want a bombshell, Rhett? Let's have one. Here we go. Sources say the Tennessee Titans are signing Jaguar star receiver Calvin Ridley. Oh. Listen to this massive deal. Four years, $92 million for Calvin Ridley. $50 million fully guaranteed in this deal, negotiated by David Mulligetta and Reza Azam of Athletes First. Calvin Ridley turns 30 this season, 30, and he gets a massive, massive deal from the Titans. Everyone has been assuming, I think this whole time, that it was going to be the Jaguars, is going to be the Patriots. No, no, it is the Tennessee Titans quietly lurking, working, and now landing a top free agent receiver, a massive, massive move for the Titans. Quietly lurking and working. All right. Poetry there. Tennessee Titans sign wide receiver Calvin Ridley, four-year deal up to $92 million, $50 million guaranteed. Demace, your initial reaction to the Calvin Ridley news? Um, well, they needed him. Um it was a plus, um, you know. I think they got better as an offense uh, just by personnel. If we're basing it on the personnel, on paper they're better yeah, today than exactly. they were two days ago. Absolutely, and and, and, and that's what you hope for um, as a organization. Um, you know, obviously, you don't win Super Bowls or championships this time of year, uh, but with what Calvin Ridley has been able to do, uh, whether it be in Atlanta or in Jacksonville, he proved that, you know, he can be a number one receiver. And I'm not too worried about the money because, listen, that's what you got to pay for a guy you, you, you deem a number one guy. Yeah. You're going to have to – and actually, he may have, you may have gotten him a little bit cheaper, you know, considering what these number one guys are getting nowadays. And everybody points to the A.J. Brown. No, that was a year. That was two years ago, people. It was a different general manager. Yesterday's money is not today's money, okay? $25 million that, that that Calvin Ridley is getting today would have been much less two years ago. So we can't keep on falling back on, uh, well, they could have traded, you know, they could have signed A.J. Brown for that money. No, it was totally different back then. Different GM, too. So would the Titans not, have been better off if they just would have re-signed A.J. Of Brown? Of course we know that. Of course. Absolutely. But, but you that's can't neither, cry over that. Exactly. That's neither here nor there. I think it was a good deal. This is what you're going to pay uh, for a guy you deemed a number one guy. Uh, people were all up in arms because they felt Ram wasn't doing enough. He goes out and he signs you a number one receiver. Now, let it all play out. I think it was a good deal. Now, looking at it based upon just personnel you got d hop you got calvin ridley and you got trailing burks and don't you forget the news that we saw coming out this morning mm -hmm. nick westbrook akine nick westbrook akine oh yeah but he's your fourth receiver but you got taxes and nick westbrook akine you gotta have things it. that are inevitable <laughs> exactly <laughs> but you have three guys that you believe in this new system once they all figure it out and we hope they all figure it out very quickly that they can that they can pose some problems for secondaries because they're all big guys they all have different sort of skill sets but you're hoping what's going to all tie together i believe is trailing burks if you can get him going now he ties together that number one that number two and now you have a bona fide number three what we're seeing is exactly what they're had what they had in, in cincinnati they had three guys in a tight end, three guys that can go out and get the job done. That's what they're trying to recreate here in Nashville. You got your three skilled guys with your tight end. He's a skilled guy as well, but I'm saying from a, from a receiver standpoint, you got three guys that you feel you can put out on the field and that more times than not you should have an advantage. And then you add the tight end in as well. Now you got four guys that you can pose problem for opposing teams secondary. But the guy that's going to tie it all together is Traylon Burks, and that's if he can come around and play the way that that I believe he can play, and I think the organization believes he can play. But no doubt, Calvin Ridley is your number one. I think I heard somebody say, "Well, D Hop is the no D Hop's not your number one now. Calvin's your number one, but who benefits 
It's D Hop. I've been telling y'all this for for the last year. You get D Hop. I think D Hop is a dog, like a D A double G. But he's getting to a point where that dog needs some help. He needs a guy to take some of the pressure off of him. You get him a number one guy, which they have, his job becomes a little bit easier. When a number one guy goes from a number one as he starts to age into that number two, you get him a bona fide number one, now he ex- you extend his, his, his ability to play at a high level because now all the pressure is not on him. All the attention is not on him. It's on Calvin Ridley. And I take D-Hop on a, on a number two corner any day, all day, three times on Sunday. Totally. Did the Titans <laughs> overpay for Calvin Ridley? Probably. But that was what it was going to take to go out and get Calvin Ridley. And can we all agree he was the best receiver on the market? Yeah, but they didn't overpay for him. But I don't think they overpaid for him. If you think that they did, I'm fine with that. Uh-huh. Like, if 20, I'm looking at it like a two-year, $25 million mm-hmm. deal. I know it's four years. I know it's 90-something. But the way that it's structured and with the guarantees, that's kind of what it feels like. And I'm cool with that. Mm-hmm. If that's what it took to get Calvin Ridley here, because you knew that Jacksonville was going to be in on the, on the sweepstakes as well. If you had to sweeten the pot a little bit with an extra million here and extra guarantees there, I'm okay with that if that's what it took to get, get Calvin Ridley because he is quick. Mm-hmm. He is speedy. And that's what this offense needed. That's what Rand Carthon and Brian Callahan talked about. That Rand just reveled in the Miami Dolphins how fast they were. The Titans don't have a speedy receiver. Calvin Ridley gives you that speed. Is he going to be your number one receiver for the next four to five years? No, he's not. But he's your number one receiver right now. The other thing is he had speed and also Let's not forget where Nick Holtz came from. He was the passing game coordinator in Jacksonville this past season. He was with Calvin Ridley this past season. So I I think that if the Titans were smart, they would have gotten that Nick Holtz seal of approval of, of, yeah, like any red flags that may exist for Calvin Ridley, I'm not concerned about, and he's worth giving the money. I think the Holtz part of it is very important Mm -hmm. uh, because I think when you invest that much in the person, uh, forget about the talent. I don't think there's ever been any question about Calvin Ridley's talent, and I and I trust D Mace. D Mace, you've been talking about him for the last couple of years. Uh, when he was suspended, you know what he would bring to the table when he came back into the league. But I think Holtz has that extra layer of knowing the person because Calvin Ridley has had a couple of different things. It wasn't just the gambling, right? He went through some stuff when he was playing with Atlanta. He had some mental health things and I I hope that he has gotten everything straightened out because he's an impressive talent there's no question and so they need to you know when you invest that money Mm -hmm. in a guy it's not just investing in the talent you're investing in the person and how he meshes with the Andre Hopkins is going to be important and so Holtz had to sort of say yeah this let's go get this guy because he can really help us so they they really they felt strongly about it and I, I think that having the Nick Holt seal of approval is important mm-hmm. because it feels very icky, and I don't want to say that that Calvin Ridley sitting at this season for mental health issues is a red flag, mm-hmm. but because cal- but focusing on mental health is incredibly important, but anything that keeps you off of the field for whatever reason, injury or mental health or suspension whatever it might be you have to look at that and say is that going to be a problem for us moving forward because we need you on the field we're pl- we're paying you to be on the field and to consistently stay on the field so i think that the the, the nick holt saying like yeah green light that's that's a guy that's worth paying the money to i think is incredibly important now i think one thing that can't go ignored is right you bring in calvin ridley mm-hmm. you bring back nick westbrook akine do you have the wide receiver position solved for the next three, five, ten years? No, because you only have D-Hop for one more year. I don't think that Calvin Ridley's your long-term answer. Nick Westbrook Akine absolutely is not your long-term answer. We'll see with Traylon Burks how he plays this upcoming season. But at least for right now, do you feel okay enough at the wide receiver position that the, that the Titans – could do something else with that second overall pick. I think they absolutely still could take a receiver, whether it's in the first round or in the second round. But if a corner comes around at 38, 
if the asking price for Legereus Sneed is is the second overall pick, the 38th, or excuse me, the second round pick, 38th overall pick, would you now, with the Calvin Ridley signing, feel comfortable enough at the wide receiver position to shop around your options with the with the 38th overall pick? I don't think you're ever comfortable with you know anything on your roster. Uh, even if you you know you have your stud quarterback, you're not comfortable because you always want to build around that stud quarterback, uh, whoever it is. I'm sure Kansas City is not comfortable because they won you know back-to-back Super Bowls. They want to win that third one. So, but do you feel like you have enough at uh, receiver? No, I don't think they. I don't think they have enough from this standpoint because, and, and you said it, Caroline. This is we're playing a long game. We're not playing a short game, fans. We're playing a long game. And a long game suggests that D-Hop is not going to be in the future for the long game. This year, yes. Maybe even next year. I don't know. Maybe he can sign a one-year deal just to come back next year. But beyond that, we need young, we need more receivers. We're going to need younger receivers. We're going to need someone that can grow with Will Levis. Hopefully, Traylon comes around. If he does, great. If he doesn't, then you're going to need two to to eventually grow with Will Levis. So I don't think the Titans are satisfied. Now, will they use that second pick, you know, that 38th pick in the second round on a wide receiver? I'm not sure. Um, But, you know, what I said before they even signed Calvin Ridley, I said to me, it's the offensive line and then it's the cornerback and then wide receiver. If you're talking about, you know, um, how do we prioritize the positions, I said you needed a left tackle, and you need someone to combat all these damn receivers that are in your division. You need a cornerback, and right now you don't have them. I know you went and got the kid from um, 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 Cincinnati, Cincinnati. yeah, but you still need another guy because you don't have – your secondary is not set. So even with the signing of Ridley, you do need another young wide receiver, but I think more importantly you need a cornerback that's going to combat you with all these wide receivers that are now in your division. And I'm not even talking about just the AFC, period. So now that the Titans have signed Calvin Ridley, let's just say, Legereus Need and the asking price is this year's second-round pick. Would you feel more comfortable doing that today than you did before the Titans signed Calvin Ridley? I still wouldn't give up a second-round pick. I don't know how you feel about it, Willie, but I still wouldn't give up that second-round pick because we still have needs. For Legereus Need? Yeah. Uh, I, I just, at, at this point, with that big investment, I mean, how much money do we have here? I, I, like, I, no, they <laughs> still got the $40 million, yeah, yeah. got plenty of money. Uh, but, but to still, me, but, uh, Ladarius Sneed wasn't still, even the I mean, best like, defensive think back. I think McDuffie was. I, I, I feel like that takes you out of the Sneed thing it, 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 with the investment in Ridley. I, I think you've got to try to hold back some flexibility, some resources. You can't go spend everything. I still am in the mode of you're building this year to really have it hit when your quarterback matures for the following year. And so that, that may be just me. I don't know. Maybe they'll take a big swing because Ridley was a big swing. But how many big swings do you have? I mean, you're just going to blow all the money, and then you're right up against the cap. Again, if you don't watch out, and you're, you're tying a lot of money to a small amount of players, we'll, we'll see. I, 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 but I, I'm kind of leaning away from the Sneed thing. I kind of like the idea of now that you have the wide receiver position addressed, You've got a year where Burks is basically being told, you got to find your spot. Look, we're not holding a spot for you. Now you have to find your way into this equation somewhere. And I, I like the idea of drafting the offensive lineman and then maybe drafting a corner now with the second round. You don't have to draft a wide receiver that early now. I don't. Th- if the Titans did still address receiver with 7th overall or 38th overall, I don't think that's a bad move. I don't think there's ever a... a- a position that you can find yourself in where it's like, man, we have too many good receivers. You know, like, wow, look at all this wealth of receivers that we have. Well, I'm going to tell you But this, this at least gives you flexibility. If, they're dra- if they draft a receiver in the first round, Traylon Burks may be on the trading blocks. And that's just I real think that's talk. Fair. It's real. One of them on the trading blocks. And it's either D Hop or Traylon. I lean more heavier toward Traylon. If they do indeed address a wide receiver in the first round, but it could be D Hop as well, somebody would have to then be moved if you address the wide receiver spot with the seventh pick. And I think it would yeah. be Traylon. I think you would get more but what are you return gonna get? for Traylon. What are you going to get for him? Yeah. Maybe like a fifth round pick. 
Why, why would you? Why would? Why not just wait and see if Traylon Burks can be worth more than that than a fifth round pick? If that's yeah. all it is. If if you've gotten to the I, point I, where wait and see is no longer more? an option. I don't, I don't think D-Hop could get you more only because of the age. I think there's a GM out there that could fall in love with the potential of Traylon Burks and the raw talent of Traylon Burks and be able to have him longer than you would be able to have D-Hop. Uh, I'm still keeping Burks if that's all it is. I, I think there's yeah. still hope if if uh, if the thing if it, if it hits right. And you do have to think beyond this coming year because, as D-Mates mentioned, DeAndre Hopkins is aging and his contract will be up after this year. And now that the Titans have signed Calvin Ridley, what does that mean for their offseason plan? Because I think now that opens up options. That opens up, uh, opens up options for the first overall pick, the, the 38th overall pick, first round pick, rather. Um, what you could do in a trade, what you could do in free agency. So we'll continue that conversation coming up next. We'll get into your phones as well. 615-737-1025 is the phone number. Caroline Willie D. Mace. And the NCAA tournament is right around the corner, and it is time for you to sign up and play the official 1025 The Game Bracket Challenge, brought to you by ESPN Bet Sportsbook, Twin Peaks, and Volunteer Hose and Gasket. Go to thegamenashville.com slash bracket challenge or the 1025 The Game Nashville app right now and sign up to play for your chance to win four-day passes to Bonnaroo. Brackets will open after the teams have been selected on Sunday, March 17th, live out here at BetMGM Sports Lounge, 1025-1063 The Game.
Welcome. Caroline Willie D. Mays for live out here at the Bet MGM Sports Lounge at Bridgestone Arena. The SEC tournament is in action. LSU leads Mississippi State 29 to 22 with nine seconds left in the first half. We'll keep you updated with all of the action throughout the day here. But first, we're reacting to the Titans signing Calvin Ridley. Four years, 90-something million. I don't have it up in front of me, but $50 million of that <laughs> is guaranteed. Um, I look at it and I think, okay, now you've signed Calvin Ridley. You bring back Nick Westbrook Aquina. You've got D-Hop, Calvin Ridley, NWI, Traylon Burks, we'll see. Kyle Phillips, we'll see. But this not, makes me feel a little bit more comfortable about the receiver position, that if the Titans decide to address offensive line in the first round, then now in the second round that I looked at that 38th overall pick as kind of the receiver pick, now you might feel more comfortable going out and getting a corner if a corner is available with the 38th overall pick. Even trading the 38th overall pick for a luxurious need if the, if the Kansas City Chiefs would be on board with that. That's something that I, I would be fine with, frankly. I know, Willie, you're afraid about the money. But I say, hey, you got to spend if you want to win in this league. And I I would be fine now that the Titans have signed Calvin Ridley if the second round pick was in question or was the asking price for Legereus need. But now I wonder, what does this mean for Traylon Burks? Mm. Well, I mean, what this may mean for Traylon Burks, and, and, and I think either you said it, Willie, or Caroline, you said it. Now he has to find his space. He has to find his place within the, the, the rotation. He has to create his yeah, space in this create rotation. Create it, find it, take it, whatever it is. He has to. It's no longer a given. When you are drafted in the first round as high as he was, it's a given. You are going to be in the lineup if you show anything, especially how everything happened. Trading away one guy, drafting him. You just assume that you're going into a situation where – if you're not the number one, you're the number two. So there was a place created for you yeah. already. Well, you know, Traylon's in a position now with them going to get D-Hop last year, them getting Calvin this year, signing Nick Westbrook-Akine back. We figure they may go out and get another receiver. They still got Kyle Phillips on the, uh, you know, on the roster. He has to take a position. He has to create his own, you know, sort of lane. And this is so familiar to me because this is what I went through. You know, being a, I wasn't a first round draft pick, but I showed my worth very early in my career. My first year, I showed that I could play, but I had to fight through all the bureaucracy and the, all the, the draft picks and them bringing in guys. And I created my space. Yeah. I took my space. I forced them to put me in a lineup. Now, it was because of injury. But I forced him to put me in the lineup, but keep me there. That's what Traylon has to do because now he went from the penthouse. He's not in the outhouse yet, but he's damn near close. So now he has to create and take a position, a spot, because it's not given to him anymore. And I believe he will, but he has to create it and take it now because two of the spots are already taken. Your number one guy and your number two guy. If you want to be on this team, you got to take hold of that number three spot and push that number two, which is DeAndre Hopkins. You got to push him to become that number two eventually. Yeah, I, yeah. I could not agree more. That's well said. I, I think, uh, you know, when you're the number one pick, you do get space sort of set aside for a while. Uh, and I noticed that as a 25th round pick for the Blue Jays, I wasn't getting put in the positions as the first or second round pick. You know, those guys get the advantage early. But over time, if you don't do it, then you get thrown back into the pile with everybody else. And you just got to earn your way in. So that's where Burks is. Maybe that'll bring out the best of it. We'll see. We shall see. All right, coming up next, Elliot Freeman, 32 Thoughts Podcast and Sportsnet will join us. I mean, last week, Elliot was multitasking times 10. He was tweeting. He was on the phone with us, talking to us. He was getting texts from agents and from GMs across the league. Hopefully, Elliot has some time to at least breathe. So we will recap the uh, NHL trade deadline with Elliot and kind of preview the playoffs. Predators, massive win last night, 4-2 to two over Winnipeg. We'll get Elliot's thoughts on that coming up next. Caroline Willie, D. Mace, 102.5, 106.3 The Game.
Caroline, Willie, D. Mays, 1025-1063, The Game in the Game Nashville app. We're streaming live on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook Live every single day. And today we are live at the Bet MGM Sports Lounge at Bridgestone Arena. And it's starting to fill in oh, more, yes, and more and more. The SEC tournament fever is on. LSU and Mississippi State are at the half. LSU leads Mississippi State 29 to 22. But we'll keep you updated with all of the SEC tournament action all day long. But those Nashville Predators just continue to find ways to pick up points and to pick up wins and joining us now to break down all of the craziness of the NHL trade deadline is Elliot Friedman 32 thoughts podcast and Sportsnet. Elliot I'm hoping today is just a little bit lower stress than maybe the last time that we talked on NHL trade deadline day. I would say Carolyn that is definitely true uh, it's been a lot quieter for me this week I took kind of a, a working vacation and I have to say the Thursday before the NCAA tournament starts with all the conference tournaments on. Those were one of the days where I, I never got any work done. I, you know, I since I grew up in Toronto, I was more of a Big East guy in its heyday, like the Patrick Ewing, Eric Coleman, uh, like Pearl Washington. Conference. Yeah, good, good days. But I'm jealous of you guys sitting in your uh, lounge, sitting in that lounge there watching the Southeastern Conference basketball tournament. Brings me back to the days of watching... Bob Knight and Eddie Sutton scream at each other. Oh, weren't those the days? The good, the good old days, one yeah. might say. Uh, well, enjoy your working vacation, Elliot. Appreciate you for still joining us on your vacation. It's very, very well deserved. Well, the Predators no ra- round out uh, the trade deadline, bringing in Anthony Bavillier from Chicago, Jason Zucker from Arizona. The Predators trade Yakov Trenin to the Colorado Avalanche and have some, some swapping of AHL players here, there as well. What yeah. did you make of Barry Trotz's moves at the trade deadline and what that means for this team throughout the rest of the season? Well, I, I think a couple of things. First of all, I, you know, I, I, to me, like the, the biggest one was actually the one that didn't happen, and that is Carrier. Because if you look at what Trotz was doing, he didn't want to subtract. Um, yes, he traded uh, Trenin, um, and I think it was simply that they didn't think they were going to be able to work out an extension with Trennan, so they wanted to, so they moved on. But, you know, he made sure he brought in scoring. The Predators have talked all year long about uh, getting in scoring, and, you know, he brought in Beau Villiers, who's a talented guy who it hasn't unfortunately worked out for well lately, but he's a talented guy, and Trotz knows him. And to me, the big one was Zucker. Like, he's, like, he's a really talented guy. And there's no way he should have gone for a sixth-round pick. Like, that's just robbery. And the reason he went for a sixth-round pick is because the Coyotes were not willing to keep money. And so, like, I think that was a steal of a deal for Nashville, and I bet it went over huge in the room. But the one that really stood out for me was Carrier, because on the morning of the trade deadline, you check in with everyone who needs to be signed, and there's, there's two questions you're asking, okay? Question one is, is anything going to get done today? If the answer is yes, then you just kind of move on and you wait for it to get done. But the, if the answer is no, then the question becomes, what next? And does that mean do you keep the player or do you trade the player? And like it was clear in the morning that the Predators weren't sure that they were going to be able to get a deal done with Carrier. But they knew if they subtracted him, then that was really going to hurt them. And so I think the message that Trot sent was, okay, um, we, we may not get this done, but if we subtract this player, we're going to be in trouble because we cannot replace them. It would be very hard to find a guy who can do what Carrier does for you guys. So I thought that was really big that you kept him. I think it, w- it probably went over big in the room, and now you've got to work and see if you can get an extension done. And that's the really difficult balance that Barry Trotz is now tasked with with balancing is the now versus the future. And Barry Trotz has said that, yeah. look, I, I feel like I owe this team the opportunity to stay together and to make a push in the playoffs and to compete in the playoffs. And that is that holding on to carry a move that's, you know, that's re-signing the players that they did, whether it be a, a Tommy Novak or a Dante Fabro or Michael McCarron, so on and so forth. But also, looking ahead to the future, the moves that didn't get done, Barry Trotz is now going to be 
talking a lot of contracts over the summer, whether that's extending UC Soros. So now kind of looking past the playoffs and looking ahead to the summer and some of the contracts that did not get done at the trade deadline, what's next for Barry Trotz? Well, I, I think you, you continue to work at things, but, you know, Carolyn, I think at this time of year, you don't want to bother players unless you absolutely have to. Um, I, I know there's, like, a lot of the really uh, – I don't know if I want to call them old school thinkers, but like, like for one, like for one thing, like one, I remember Ken Holland, who's the GM at Edmonton, and he's been around a long time. I would text him late in the year saying, you know, anything going on with this extension, anything going on with this extension, and he would kind of jokingly say to me, "I don't know how many times I have to tell you, I don't believe in doing extensions right before the playoffs," mm-hmm. and um, I think there's, there, I think there are people who feel that way. Um, now, I think what can happen is Trotz can reach out to the agents and he can talk to them. But generally at this time of year, and it's not always the case, like that's the thing. We're still getting an idea of what Trotz believes as a GM, what his philosophies are. But, you know, generally a lot of teams don't say, look, we're going for the playoffs. This is the most important time of the year. Don't bug the players. Don't, don't get their minds on anything they don't have to worry on. So, I think what he'll do is he'll continue to talk to the agents, kind of feel them out. See, like basically right now, the agent for Carrier and Trotz, they know where each other stands. Like at the deadline, you get serious. So they kind of know where everybody is and they kind of figure out what a, what a deal could look like. And also too, the way he plays between now and then and the other guys as well, Carolyn, um, it, it determines, you know, whether, that their asks or their gets change. And I think right now, I think right now your primary focus is the march of the playoffs and getting there, and everything else is secondary. We're talking to Elliot, Elliot Friedman. You can check him out on his Thirty Two Thought podcast. Um, now, Elliot, looking at what the Nashville Predators were able to do last night versus the Winnipeg Jets, where do you stack this team up? Because they've beaten Winnipeg, they've beaten the Avalanche. Uh, you know, you look at, you know, whether it's Minnesota or, or Columbus, they've sort of matched up well with these teams and come and have come out on the winning on the winning side of it. But where do you where do they sort of match up with this with these teams moving forward? Because this was the question that we had Coach Brunette when we had him on earlier. Like, was that a mm-hmm. measuring stick type of game for your team to go to Winnipeg and to beat that team? Well, it is, and it doesn't matter that Mark Shifley's not playing. Like, that's a big loss for the Jets, but you still got to win the game in, in a very hostile environment. And, um, you know, I, I think this, Derek, I think the Predators, the biggest thing the Predators have changed this year is the way, like, people look at them. And l- they were kind of meh uh, at the beginning of the year. What, what did everybody think about them? Meh. They're kind of... Who knows what they are? They're, they, they might be good. They probably won't be good. You know, a lot of people thought, you remember, remember in like that first month of the season, there was one day they were 31st in the league and everybody kind of thought, okay, that's Nashville this year. We don't have to worry about them. Well, you know, now we're seeing they're, they're, they're in the playoff spot. The odds are really good. They're going to make the playoffs. Um, they've played, you know, really hard this year. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to belabor the point because I don't think that story needs to be revisited a ton. But I don't think it's, I don't think it's insignificant that after the U2 thing happened, the Predators didn't fold. Like I've seen teams fold after those kinds of things. And what this says to me is that's a team of real pros. But you know, the thing, Derek, I really noticed last night was watching Yossi. You know, this the the, the Norris this year best defenseman it's going to be hard like there's you know Makar is incredible Quinn Hughes is incredible but I, like watching Yossi last night you know Andrew Burnett asked him to change the way he plays a little bit less carrying the puck move the puck and that pass he made last night on that first goal like to me that is just a reminder of how good he is and how he's probably even better than he gets credit for. Because he's got the skill set to make that pass, and he's changed the way he's played for years. The way, the way he won the Norris Trophy to 
do what his coach wants and is asking. And, you know, I, I just think that the Predators this year have created respect. They're much better than we thought they were. And I'll tell you, Derek, that first round of the playoffs in the West, it is going to be brutal. Like, it's a good thing I don't gamble a lot of money because I lose a lot of money gambling on that one. Elliot Friedman is with us. Uh, Elliot, along those lines, uh, I, you know, Nashville's not there yet. They've got to keep getting some points here. But you figure if they go 500 or so, their odds are really, really good of getting in there to play somebody. Uh, you know, Colorado got a got a huge win last night. It come from behind fashion. Yeah. As you look at these teams now that they've got their new pieces, yeah. In the central specifically, who who do you think will come out on top in that division? Because it's going to be a heck of a race uh, for those three teams. Honestly, I think the deepest team is Dallas. I do. I think top to bottom, one to twenty three. I think they're the deepest team. I know that's not going to make me a really popular guy on Broadway, but, you know, the one thing about Dallas is Ottinger hasn't had a great season, so I think he has to get back to his level. But I think top to bottom, they're the deepest team. But, you know, like Colorado, I like some of the moves they made. They got meaner. I mean, you guys know Trennan, that Duhame is uh, a, a tough player too, a hard player. They're deeper on defense a bit with uh, Walker. They gave up Byram. Like, Byram, for me, I understood why they did it, but when they won the Stanley Cup a couple of years ago, he was incredible for them. Um, middle stat, like, I think they're a deeper team than they were two weeks ago. Um, Winnipeg, I mean, they've got the best goalie, and when you've got the best goalie, you're a threat, uh, a big threat. But to me, I, I, th- I would give a slight edge to Dallas, but – Honestly, Willie, it's the the margins are very thin, and in the playoffs, it, it, like these series, they're going to be brutal. Like they are just going to be brutal, brutal series. And with, with all of these teams, what time did you get home about, this morning, Willie? Uh, well, we gained two hours going from uh, Winnipeg to Seattle, so it was <laughs> it was two thirty Central Time when we got into the hotel, but it was only twelve thirty. Pacific time. So it was a weird, we're still in a weird zone here trying to adjust. Uh, That's to, dedication, to what's going Willie. On. If I, if I right. couldn't go to the lounge today, I wouldn't show up for work. I got to tell you. Like those guys get, <laughs> Carolyn and Darren get to be in the lounge and you're sitting in what, your hotel room? That's a tough draw, yeah. man. <laughs> that is tough a little draw. bit of a tough draw. A little bit of a tough draw, but it's a nice day. It's not raining in Seattle. It's a beautiful day. So oh, that's, a, that's a good thing. And they don't play until uh, Saturday. So a little time to, to get adjusted here. I was going to ask you, too, about Andrew Burnett and the job he's doing. He's now 89-43-10 and 10 as a yeah. head coach. We know the story, and he's, been, he's admitted it. You know, he was hurt that he did not get retained by the Panthers after, he, what, after yeah. what he did that season for them. And then yeah. you got this whole saga at New Jersey. They've now moved on from Lindy Ruff, and I know the question's being yeah. asked there. Did they let the wrong – you know, did they let Burnett get away – when maybe that was the guy they really needed to think about keeping. But Barry Trotz looks very smart for, for hiring this guy. But when you, you just got done talking about the Predators. They're, they're more than the sum of the parts, right? When you look at the names yes. on the page of the lineup, they're playing way above that level. I have to think Andrew Burnett has a lot to do with that. Yeah, I, I, I do. I, I, like, I, like, I, I think Burnett's a really smart guy. Like When he played, he was a really popular teammate. When he went into coaching, he was, a, he was a pretty popular guy. He got thrust into a really tough situation in Florida, and I know he was hurt, and uh, I think anybody would. Like, I, I think sometimes, Willie, and, 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 you know, Derek, you really understand this, and I've learned it over the years in covering sports. Like, in sports, you, you have to have a big ego simply because you are on field competing against like a lot of alphas. And it doesn't mean you have to be a jerk or anything like that, but you really have to believe in yourself and you have to believe you are capable of things in stressful situations. And Andrew Burnett, even though he's a really nice guy, he's like that. He believes in himself. He, he, he survived as a pro for a long time, and that doesn't come out with a, or doesn't happen without an immense belief in what you're capable of and what you can do. And look, I think he's proving that here. Um, um, 
I, I really like the Predators. I, I, you know, because I come on here, I watch them quite a bit, and I like the way they play. I, I think they're a really interesting team. And, you know, like I said, I think they've handled themselves really professionally this season. And, uh, and I think it says a lot about the group they've put together and the group that's running. Uh, I'm curious, you, you get into all of the stuff with all of these moves and, and the teams that have really loaded up at the deadline. Vegas, Colorado, Dallas, the teams yep. in the East, they have all jumped in there, and they're being praised for their aggressiveness. And I, I, I admire that for sure. But as yep. you mentioned, just because a lot of them are going to play each other in the first round, multiple teams are going to say, we did all this, and then we lost in the first round. And I keep looking at some of these teams that are just de- depleting all of their assets for the future. Not many prospects, not many draft picks going forward. And I wonder what the feeling will be with some of these teams in another three or four years on that. Will, will they get the same praise that they're getting right now for their aggressiveness? Because it's not going to work for everybody. Well, probably not, because that's the way the world works. We're the ultimate second guessers, right, Willie? But, right. you know, I have a rule. I, I have a rule. I always make a note of what I say in the moment, and I don't vary from that. I, I kind of look back and I say, okay, what did I say then? Well, maybe things turned out differently, but I can't change my opinion about how you felt at the time. Um, you know, the thing is, like, for me, the perfect example is Carolina. Carolina had an organizational philosophy. No rentals, no rentals, no rentals. Well, we don't pay for rentals. If it's a mid-round pick, we'll give you, uh, we'll do that. But we're not trading a first-round pick or a good prospect for rentals. Well, you know, I, I, this, last year, they go to the Eastern Conference Final against Florida, and they can't score. They absolutely cannot score. They had, what, three goals in four games? And they got knocked out. And they had to watch the Panthers, who earned it but were decimated by injury, lose to Vegas. And I guarantee to you the Hurricanes are sitting there saying, we could have given this a better shot. We could have given this a better shot. And so now this year they say, you know what, we're going to go for it. We're going to change our philosophy a bit, and we're going to pay a bit more of a price because we've got a good team, and we saw what happened last year. And I I really believe, Willie, that's the only way that you can be judged is – do you think you have a good team? Yes. Then you go for it. Um, Because I'll tell you this. Yeah, you might lose. And Brian Burke always sends me a text. He says, last time I checked, they're still only handing out one Stanley Cup. I know. I know. But look, the Tampa Bay Lightning won two. Um, They're decimated now. They don't have, they're starting to slow down a bit. They don't have the assets to make deals, but I would. I don't care. Like if I was a member of the Lightning or a Lightning fan, I would say it was all worth it. All worth it because we won two cups, and that's the way I always look at it. I, I noticed you wrote this in your in your blog today, and you guys are kicking around ideas. And look, everybody's favorite team, Vegas. This is going to be talked about with the LTI are maneuvering. They're not the only team that does it. It's within the rules. We all understand that. Yeah. I think the question you're bringing up is, will the rules change? Because this is not why they put the rule in, so that you could end up doing what these teams have done successfully and end up with everybody back with sort of a bolstered roster with extra payroll in the playoffs. Do you think in the next CBA they will change that in some degree? I think, you know what, I think, Willie, I, I think people get upset in the moment. I'm really curious to see if when it really matters, when it really matters, does anyone really want to change it? Because there's always a lot of noise. Now, I'll say this. You know, someone saw me write that, and they said to me yeah, uh, this morning, they said, I guarantee I know what will get it changed. And I said, oh, yeah, what's that? And he goes, if Mark Stone shows up in game one, like, it'll be over. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, I, and, like, he has a legit injury. Like, that spleen injury, that's a legit injury. Um, uh, you know, like I said, I've had a couple people throw suggestions at me. Things like, if you can't play game 82, then you've got to miss a round of the playoffs. Or in the playoffs, your dressed roster has to be under the cap. Your non-dressed roster, like it doesn't matter who's not playing, but just your dressed roster is under the cap. So there's ideas there. But I, I, th- that's the one thing I really don't know. Like, there's always outrage and there's always anger. But, like, 
anyone who could do this would and should. So I always wonder, Willie, is it just noise or is it real that they're going to change it? Those those Vegas Golden Knights just always almost breaking the rules, pushing up against that line, <laughs> but not quite crossing it. Elliot, really appreciate you for joining us. Enjoy your working vacation, and we'll chat with you soon. Does Dale Brown still coach LSU, or am I way off on this? Way oh. off on that. Uh, <laughs> I the court played against is Dale named Brown. after Elliot, Dale Brown. I played against Dale Brown at, at Memorial Gym in Nashville with Shaquille O'Neal. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Vanderbilt versus LSU. Game tied in the final seconds. They call a foul on Shaq, which was probably not a foul. A little home cooking, maybe. And yeah. so Vanderbilt shoots a couple free throws. Dale Brown goes crazy, runs out to half court, and gets tossed from the game. And it's still one of the mo my favorite moments as a, as a college basketball player. That was something. So he was, he was a wacko, but he, he was really good. Was that like the Will Purdue, like Barry Goheen days, or is that after that? I was I was just after that. I was just after Will Purdue and Barry Goheen. And that's why they okay. went and got Willie, because they lost Will Purdue. <laughs> exactly. So we got to get another right. player. So we right. need someone to compete with Shaquille O'Neal. Exactly. Neal. We need someone to guard Willie Shaquille O'Neal. Willie Donick is the guy. <laughs> the hack of Shaq D, I was there. I, I, could, I could foul Shaq with the best of them. I had fouls to give. That's a great story. That's awesome. That's a great uh. story. All right, Elliot, we appreciate you, and we will enjoy the BetMGM Lounge on your behalf. Take care, guys. Yep. Appreciate it. Really? I mean, LSU home cooking? LSU breaking the rules? Nah. Sports? Oh, no, no, no. It Never. was Vanderbilt home cooking. It was oh, Vanderbilt oh, home oh, cooking. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, no. Vanderbilt defeats LSU and Shaq that day, and we shot about six free throws at the end of the game mm -hmm. because there was the foul on Shaq. He got mad. He got a tech, and then Dale Brown got two techs and got thrown out. So I lost track of how many free throws we shot at the end of the game. But it was it was only like three seconds left in the game. And he ended up uh, chasing down a cameraman, I think, for Channel 5. Dale Brown did. Uh, and just, you know, he ran into him in the parking garage or something and followed oh him and just, oh, it was, gr it was great TV. Great TV. Uh -huh. Dale Brown was great TV. It, Never it dull. Dale, never dull. Spicy, and spicy how, Dale how Brown. How they didn't go to the Final Four when they had Shaq for three years, I'll never really understand. There are a lot of stories of LSU basketball shortcomings that I truly never will be able to understand. But speaking of LSU basketball, they lead Mississippi State 34-32 to with just over 13 and a half minutes. Uh, I take that back. It is now a tie game. 13 and a half to go <laughs> in the second half. We're live out here at Betm Gym Sports Lounge. The SEC tournament is underway. Coming up next, we touched on a lot. The, uh, Jerry Stackhouse has been relieved of his duties as the head basketball coach at Vanderbilt. Titans sign Calvin Ridley. The Predators get a 4-2 win over the Winnipeg Jets last night. All of that is on the table, and we will get right to your phones on that coming up next. Caroline, Willie, D. Mace, we are brought to you by Zen Sports. Start earning cash rewards on your bets today. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-889-9789. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 or older and in Tennessee to bet. All right, let's talk Lee Company, proud sponsor of our Predators coverage. Big win for the Predators last night in Winnipeg. On to Seattle, where they take on the Kraken on Saturday night. Remember, Lee Company has your home maintenance plan ready to go. They're going to take that off of your plate. You want to feel good about your home and its long-term management with heating, air conditioning, plumbing, electric. And that's what they do. The home inspection once a year, and for your air conditioning heating, twice a year as part of your home maintenance plan. They're going to find the small problems and let you know before they become big problems and you're in the middle of the summer and it's 98 and you don't have your air conditioning working. That's what you avoid with that preventive maintenance from the home maintenance plan at Lee Company. Call 615-567-1000 or go to LeeCompany.com and find out more about the home maintenance plan. It is going to be worth your time and investment. That's what we do in the Donick House. We have for a long time. It's good stuff. Lead Company, proud sponsor of the Nashville Predators, and let their decades of expertise go to work for you.
Caroline, Willie, D. Mace. We're broadcasting from the Spring Hill Heating and Cooling Game Nashville Studios, which today is the Bet MGM Sports Lounge out here at Bridgestone Arena. The SEC tournament is in action. Mississippi State takes the lead over LSU, 42 to 36. Just a few minutes left in the second game, in the second half there in that game. Coming up next is Arkansas taking on five seed South Carolina. But I want to get into your thoughts. Everything is on the table. The Predators win last night. What we heard from Elliot Friedman in the last segment. Titans signing Calvin Ridley. It is all on the table. Our phone lines are driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com and Scott in Franklin will kick us off here. What's up, Scott? Hey, I had a question for Willie and um, sorry, it's about last Sunday's game. Y'all have been talking a whole lot of hockey this week, but um, Willie, did you did, did the coaching staff ever address or ever mention to you or why they didn't challenge that goal? It looked it looked to me just like open and shut goalie interference. I mean, the guy had Soros's leg pinned down until like the moment before the puck was hit in. Did, did anything was was that ever addressed? What, and did you think it was as clear interference as I did? You're talking about a goal against the Wild that the Wild scored uh, where it did look like there was a lot of contact there. I, I didn't ask about that one specifically uh, since then. We didn't do the game, uh, so that it kind of was water under the bridge at, at that point. But here's what they say a lot in those. They look at it, and if the call on the ice is a goal, if they determine that it's not clear cut, most of the time they're not overturning the call. So the risk of challenging and losing the challenge where the goal counts and the team gets a power play, that has them very hesitant, I think, at times uh, to challenge. And I think there was a little question of whether the player was pushed into Soros uh, and whether, it, whether by the time the puck was going into the net, well, if Soros had a chance to recover. I think that was very borderline. I think they definitely considered it, but I think uh, with the call on the ice being a goal, they just didn't feel sure enough and early enough in the game to where they, they wanted to, on the road, give up a goal and then give up a power play on the heels of that. that that's what the struggle is. But that, I see what you're seeing there. That was very close. The announcers thought it might be challenged, and I, I think they definitely considered it. It is so tough whenever the difference is a hair. You almost have to just defer to what the call on the ice was. And that applies, I think, to every sport. If there's any sort of review whatsoever in football or basketball or hockey, so on and so forth, when the difference is, like, centimeters, you just defer to what the referees initially yep. saw. Well, that's what interesting play last night with the high stick. Initially, they come right out and say, no goal, high yeah. stick on the Jets. And this is the shutout for UC Soros that he's a few minutes away from getting. Yeah. So that's a call where you're like, okay, the shutout's still intact. But then they huddle up, and this is what I don't understand, is one of the refs said, no, I don't think it was a high stick. So let's change the call on the ice to a goal, which changes everything. And then they go look at it. And a high stick is very tough to, to really see definitively with no matter how many camera angles you have. I think it's a flaw in the replay system. It's hard to figure out whether a puck was high stick. And they, I know they do the best they can. We need like lasers or something. But they, <laughs> because the call on the ice was a goal and they switched it, they couldn't overturn it when they looked at it. So I don't think Andrew Burnett liked how that whole shuffle went. I, when you change the call on the ice before you go review it, to yeah. me, that's weird. That is weird. That is weird. I right, get back into some of your texts. Tyler texts in about the question that I posed earlier, now that the Titans have signed Calvin Ridley, they're bringing back Nick Westbrook Akine, mm -hmm. does that now give you more flexibility with your second round pick? I think it does. If you still want to go out and get a receiver, get a receiver. If you want to get a corner, get a corner. But Tyler Texan says, you guys are absolutely nuts. The odds are significantly higher on hitting on a receiver in the second round than in a later round. And conversely, it's easier to hit on a corner in the fourth. You've got to draft tackle in the first round in the first, receiver in the second, and then quarter in the fourth. I don't know if there is data to back up exactly, that claim. Yeah. I don't know if that's a, a true statement. Yeah, if you can give us the data, we we can better, you know, forward your argument. Yeah. Or, you know, 
uh, uh, expound on your argument, but I think past the first two or three yeah. rounds, really most positions are just kind of a uh, is hit or well, miss. It's yeah. hit or miss. But what I think is absolutely nuts is on March 14th saying, when the draft is in late April, saying you have to do this in the first round, you have to do this in the second round, and you have to do this with your third pick in the fourth round. Things change. What yeah. if Joe Walt and Ola Fashnu are off the board at, you know, five and six? Exactly. You don't have to go tackle at seven if your number one targets aren't there at that position. Then you, you readjust. You let the board fall, and you let it come to you. You don't predetermine. Yeah, you, you can't. You, in a perfect world, considering – you know what they what they have done addressing the wide receiver position um you know addressing the guard position or let's say the offensive line but not particularly the left tackle position but you've addressed some of your needs so now in the draft you look at it at from a standpoint of okay can we are we in a position to if it falls our way to draft our tackle mm-hmm. or to draft our receiver well, if the fall, if the draft falls the way you believe it will, then you take your tackle if he's there. Mm-hmm. If not, then you got to readjust and, and and sort of go with what the board say. You may end up trading down because the two guys that you wanted are not there. Whether yeah. it's the receiver that you wanted or the tackle that you wanted, now you got to reevaluate. That's why you can't predetermine. This is what I like. You said this is what I need. Yeah, yeah these are needs that you have, but what if those needs are taken? Then what do you do as a GM? Yeah. I'm sure they have contingency plans in place, but what what they have done via free agency does sort of, you know, highlight some other needs that they can address in the draft, yeah. whether it be receiver, whether it be tackle, or whether it be corner. Again, you're asking me if, if, if it was me, if I had an opportunity to get my tackle, I take them, yeah. and then I double back in the second round, and I get a corner. But the corner may not be there, and I may be you know, in a position to move down or draft a receiver. It does feel like more and more as we go throughout free agency that you're going to have to get your tackle with the seventh overall pick because yeah. if you don't get him with the seventh overall pick, where do you get your left tackle? It's yeah. not necessarily a uh, yeah. wealth of tackles in free agency. So I think right now we can say that right now it feels like you probably should get your tackle in yeah. the first round, but you also have to – you cannot reach – with the seventh overall pick. Mm -hmm. This pick is so critical and so pivotal for this team. Another text for Texan says, go ahead, Willie. Oh, go ahead, guys. Go ahead, guys. I had nothing to add. I'm with you on the left tackle. Left tackle, I think, is a high probability now of being the seventh pick. It does feel like it. One texter says, D-Mace, could the Titans trade the seventh overall pick to the Bengals for Higgins and the number 18 overall pick? So a pick swap and you get to Higgins. If so, wide receiver is solid, and you could possibly get two solid offensive linemen and Braden Frisk, Braden Fisk, the defensive lineman from Florida State in the draft. What are your thoughts? Um, I think they've addressed the wide receiver position from a veteran standpoint. I don't think they're then and, – and listen, they may. We don't know. The Titans can do just about anything because they have the space and maybe they have the, you know, um, draft – um, position being being in the seventh position to trade back and do a swap with Kansas City, but I mean I Kansas City, but Cincinnati. I don't see that happening. Yeah, I think there's a reason why they went out and they paid the money that they paid for Calvin Ridley, so they then wouldn't have to double back and give up picks and then have to pay T Higgins. They got Calvin Ridley without having to give up any picks. So if you do, if you've done that, to me it's it's going. It's counterintuitive to then go and get T. Higgins and give up picks for him, and you have to pay him. Yeah. You just paid a guy that you feel is your number one receiver now, and you didn't have to give up anything to get him. I also think oh, there's no way that the Bengals are going to trade T. Higgins just for a pick no. swap. They're no, going to want not. more yeah. than just the seventh overall pick. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that the need for T. Higgins, or at least the intrigue for T. Higgins, to me, it's it has plummeted because now you sign Calvin Ridley. Yeah. So uh, there's more of a need at the left tackle position, and you're, it's a higher likelihood of hitting on the left tackle position at 7 than you would at 18. Dustin in Hopkinsville, Texan, says, trade Burks for Sneed and use the pick to get a receiver. <laughs> well, dude, the Chiefs aren't trading Legereus Sneed for Traylon Burks. Traylon Burks has proven nothing in this league. You know, Legereus Sneed is an elite cornerback in this league. That, there, there's not going to happen. 
You're going to have to sweeten the pot. You know what, Willie? I, I proposed that um, this morning um, um, to, um, to TD. He and I were going back and forth. And I proposed that same, you know, sort of um, scenario, you know, with them getting Calvin Ridley, them having D-Hop. If indeed they wanted Ladarius Sneed, then my only, the only bargaining chip you have, I don't want to see Traylon go anywhere. I want to see him really come into his own here. But because of what they've done in the receiver room, do you then say, hey, listen, Kansas City, we can't give you a number. We can't give you up. We're not giving you our first round pick and we're not giving you our second round pick. But we can, you know, trade Traylon Burks and maybe something else next year for Ladarius Sneed. Will Kansas City go for that? I don't know. Maybe they want more, but at least that puts you in a position to to have something to offer. Because right now, if you're not offering a Traylon Burks and a pick, what else do you have to offer? Again, I don't want to see Traylon go anywhere. I want him to stay here and, and, and figure it out here. But if the coaching staff don't believe that's the case, then he may be the only guy at this point that you may be willing to, to part with that's going to help facilitate a trade like that. I just don't know how attractive of a bargaining chip Traylon Burks is at this point. Uh, yeah, would right you right rather right. have him or would you rather have a third-round pick or a second-round pick? I still think somebody's going to go in. I still think somebody's going to go in with something like that, an attractive package uh -huh. for Snead before it's all over. All right, the SEC tournament is underway. This has got to be the most fun month of the year to be in Vegas and to get in on some sports bets. So our friend Ali Melnicki from Zen Sports will join us coming up next. Caroline Willie D. Mace, 1025-1063 The Game. Enjoy 1025-1063 The Game in Guinness for Pinewood Madness. Patio SEC Watch Party tomorrow. 1025 The Game will be broadcasting live from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. So stop by and enter for your chance to win tickets to see Green Day. Showcase your skills in Pinewood Social's arcade basketball game competition. Win tournament tickets and watch all of the televised games in their jumbo LED screen. For more details, visit thegamenashville.com slash events. Happy Thursday, everyone. Hey, listen, we are in the second day of the SEC tournament down here at Bridgestone. So if you want to be, if you want to do betting, then do it with our partners in sports. And I'm happy to tell you about their introductory promotion available to all new customers in Tennessee. It's the No Danger First wager. Plus, listen, because it's the SEC tournament time and it's in full action, people, make straight bets of at least $25 on any SEC tournament game today, tomorrow, and earn $10 no danger wager for Saturday, which I believe is the championship game, right? Saturday? Sunday. Sunday is the championship game. So I guess quarterfinals uh, on Saturday. Make any straight bet of at least $25 on any SEC tournament game today, tomorrow and you get the ten dollar no danger wager for saturday bet at least 25 dollars. i've said that straight today odds must be greater than minus 200 you only get one ten dollar no danger wager per customer the no danger wager has a value of ten dollar and is bound to the terms reflected in this uh, in the article max odds up to two up, up to plus 250 for the promotional like i said okay so if you're going to do the betting if you're going to bet on sec games then do it with our partners zen sports again they're giving away the ten dollar no danger wager for saturday if you do it today actually it's 25 dollars. i'm sorry 25 dollars. if you do it today and tomorrow you get the ten dollar no danger first wager Saturday, okay? But always remember, people, 
If you have any gambling problems, call 1-800-889-9789. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 years or older to bet here in Tennessee. Caroline, Willie, D. Mays, 1025-1063, the game. We're live out here at the Bet MGM Sports Lounge at Bridgestone Arena. The SEC Tournament Day 2 is in action, where Mississippi State leads LSU 56-52 with just under five minutes to go. It's got to be the best bet sports betting month of the calendar year. <laughs> and joining us now to give us her best bets of the tournament week is Allie Melnicki, our friend over at Zen Sports. Allie, this game, this Mississippi State LSU game has been incredibly physical and back and forth, but Arkansas South Carolina comes up next. I know Arkansas hasn't had the best season, but they had a great second half against Vanderbilt last night. South Carolina is a four and a half point favorite. Who do you like in that next matchup in the SEC tournament? 
I actually like the Razorbacks to cover. I really Ooh. like teams that are doing everything they can. This might be their final game. They have a lot of guys that might be playing their final time on the court. So I'm going with the underdogs. I love betting underdogs when it comes to March Madness, especially when that seems like it should be a higher spread. So you got to wonder if there's something uh, that the odds makers knows that we don't. You know what they say, March is French for hope. That's exactly what this medal provides to some of the underdogs. Right, I'm using like, that. I'm stealing that exactly. one. Yeah, exactly. Like you, you go ahead. You go ahead. I just came up with that one. Um, Allie, let's look ahead to Sunday. Who are you? Who's your favorite to win it all in the SEC Conference Tournament? Uh, I think it's honestly going to come down between Tennessee and Kentucky. I know I say I like picking underdogs, but I like them to cover, not necessarily win. I think that it's just going to be whether it's Tennessee versus Kentucky or if Alabama gets there and it's Tennessee versus Alabama, I just think it's going to be a high-scoring game. I would stick with the over before I see the spread. So I think we're in for a lot of points in this tournament. Ali, how about a team like Auburn in this, in, in this tournament? Do you, what are the odds of them reaching the championship game and not just reaching it, possibly beating, say, a team like um, Alabama or UT? Yeah, that's going to be a tough one. I mean, Auburn is the fourth seed, so they're definitely – they could be in the semifinals against Tennessee. I just think they're not going to be able to keep up with the scoring that Tennessee does. So I'm not looking for them to make a run past the semifinals. How about the MVP for the tournament? I mean, you got to go with Dalton Neck, right? He's in the yeah. Yeah, Tennessee, I think he's the favorite, so I would uh, put my money on him. Ali, I apologize. It has to be a quick one this week, but we'll recap all of the conference tournament action next week. We appreciate your time, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh-huh. All right, appreciate it. Ali Melnicki, our friend over at Zen Sports. That is going to do it for us today. We'll be back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Stillman & Company is up next. Be love and love on your people. Peace.